<laughs> okay, well, you can stand there a little bit. And you <laughs> so I'm so pleased to see everyone's here and ha has a seat above all. Uh, so when I um, when I started to organize this event, I, of course, had no idea how many people would, would sign up. Uh, but I was really keen to do it in this room so everybody gets to experience the uh, the mountain and uh, you know, the, uh, the ski lift here. And, uh, you know, the... When I booked it, they said, listen, there's space for 50, no more than 50. And uh, so the registration started coming in, and within a few days, I was already at 35, and I was like, if it carries on this rate, there's going to be a problem. And then we kind of raced past 50, and then came 55 and 60. And I found out, listen, it's not the possibility of maybe fitting in a few more chairs, or maybe people can stand at the back, and 50 is the absolute limit. <laughs> So anyway, I arrived here yesterday just to check the room, check the room over, and I said, so this will be the 50 chairs, will it? And they're like, no, you said 65. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm super happy everyone has a seat. Um, so we're going to, um, uh, <coughs> let me start by just quickly running through uh, the agenda for, uh, for the next uh, couple of days. So up until um, around about midday, it's going to be the investor meeting for RV Capital and the, the business owner fund. And the format is simply going to be Q and A. Um, I think it's the best way to do it, as you get to ask the stuff that you're interested in, rather than me uh, boring you with a PowerPoint or something for uh, however whoever knows how many uh, hours. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, but we're going to start. Uh, we're going to start with uh, a quick uh, overview of the Dagbarn Engelberg. We own about three percent of the company. We've been invested for. A, about five years, it's been a great experience uh, financially, uh, but also in terms of the people who run it. I'm super happy that uh, Esther Schneider, the company CFO, is here today, and she's going to say a few introductory uh, introductory words about uh, where we are. Then at 12, we're going to have a, a hard stop, because uh, I know a lot of people are super enthusiastic to, to get out and go and see uh, see the resort and the bubble, the slopes. Uh, James, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'll, I'll hang around here, and I know there's a lot of non-skiers. Man, maybe you can uh, take to me. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but I know there's a lot of non-skiers here. I'm going to hang around as long as necessary, and uh, if there's any questions which are still open, uh, we can um, we can talk about those. We can still do those. You can come and sit. You can come and sit here later. Sorry. Um, and uh, maybe also there's some questions which you prefer not to ask in a group, uh, so there's, there's, time, there's time for that. Um, uh, and then uh, even the non-skiers as well, I'd encourage, there's lots of things to do for non-skiers, and I think Esther will, will say uh, a few things about what the other stuff is you can do. Um, then the next event will be 6.30, we're going to have a get-together at uh, the Hotel Terrasse, which is down the mountain and a, a short walk through, uh, through the town. Um, it's going to be a very informal evening. Uh, we have uh, kind of standing uh, kind of cocktail tables rather than uh, seating, as I figured uh, a big part of uh, this weekend is giving you guys the opportunity not just to interact with me, but to interact with each other. So I'd encourage everyone to, to, uh, you know, um, to, to meet and mingle. And, uh, and uh, in actual fact, in that respect, when you, when you ask your questions uh, later, Maybe uh, everybody could just quickly uh, say say their name, where they're from, and perhaps one or two words uh, about their company or, or their background, and that will help maybe the the conversation uh, the conversations uh, this evening. Um, then uh, tomorrow we're, we're having a completely different session. Uh, something I feel very passionate about is uh, helping you know, the younger managers to to get started. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to get started as a fund manager because. Understandably, people don't want to give you their money until they can see what you can do, but until people give you their money, you can't really show them what you can do. So 
uh, it was tough for me to get started. I, I'm super happy I, I, I managed it and uh, also keen that uh, other people uh, have that opportunity as well. Um, partly because I think there's not enough talented uh, independent fund managers in, in the world. There's far too many large firms with <coughs> all the types of institutional pressures that, that they have. Uh, and also selfishly, um, I love having uh, a wide network of, of smart people and I love to see, I love to have successful people in my network and uh, if you don't help people in your network they might end up as a second ranking analyst at some uh, crappy fund and I'd much rather have people in my network who are confident and independent and have, have their own uh, thriving businesses. Um, so that will be tomorrow. Um, I'm happy to say uh, it won't just be me you hear from uh, tomorrow. Uh, I've asked uh, four of my uh, uh, longest, uh, longest standing investors to uh, also come with me because uh, I think from the perspective of a young manager, what you really want to hear about is you know uh, what, what do you know what do what do investors want? What are they looking for? So you have an opportunity to ask uh, ask them uh, as well as me, and maybe I'll quickly introduce them uh, now so you can also seek them out this evening uh, if you want to. So um, there's James here from Global Endowment. James, if you don't mind standing up. Morning. <laughs> Uh, then there's uh, Nate, uh, who's from uh, MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, there's Georg, Georg Stolberg, who uh, invests in fund managers uh, in a very similar way to, I, to how I invest in companies. He, he does it by himself. Uh, he's a one captain ship. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, the final person is uh, Jens uh, Kurs Alleman, who'll be arriving this evening. Uh, he represents the, uh, the Rentrop family office, who were the people who originally helped me to get started. Okay, so that's the agenda. Um, I hope that's clear. If not, um, there's plenty of time to, to discuss it uh, later. And without further ado, I'll ask Esther, is Esther here, to come up with me. So, so Esther is the uh, the CFO of, uh, of Engelberg. Um, um, we've, we've known each other for, I guess, five, five years or so now. And uh, there was actually a scandal at Engelberg um, uh, before, before Esther arrived, where I think her predecessor was stealing money from the company, uh, which is, of course, a, a terrible thing to happen. Um, uh, but it had a, had a, a very positive impact in that um, much more professional managers uh, then uh, joined the company. And there was an understanding that uh, the way things had been done previously um, uh, wasn't acceptable. Um, so I'm super happy that uh, Esther's here. And uh, yeah. Pass over the microphone to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, welcome, I welcome you kindly here to Engelberg and our nice mountain titles. I have to excuse my boss, uh, the CFO Norbert Pat. He's, uh, he's sorry that he couldn't join you today. He would have loved to. Um, but I will give you a short overview and uh, thank you for the interest in our company. Our company is 100 years old. We are already, we celebrated about four years ago, the 100 years. We started with the little cable car, very in the, uh, at the bottom, you still see it. We still have it in a, a little bit renewed from this one. And we grew to really and increased with now uh, around 60 to, eight, uh, 60 to 70 million of <coughs> income and uh, over 300 people are working here. We actually have cable cars, that's our main business, but we also have hotels, restaurants, especially here restaurants on the, on the line, and uh, hotels down in uh, Engelberg, as well as uh, a holiday resort. We are actually in a, in a very difficult surrounding at the moment. Um, the skier days, these are the days where uh, all the skiers come. Um, in Switzerland, it's slowly decreasing. So that's a challenge in the whole thing um, that young people not only ski, skiing anymore here in Switzerland. Um, so I get, but this is also our success because we also have uh, different segments where we actually go in the markets. And if you look at this in our market, 
from the market view, the, uh, the, the, the challenges uh, that Swiss, the winter tourism is uh, actually decreasing here in Switzerland and in Europe, it's, it's really going uh, indifferent. If you look at the Logiernechte, uh, that's the challenge too, where we, where we stand. For Switzerland, uh, it's stabilizing in Switzerland. But our luck is that, or our USP, I, I say, is that we have the uh, different segments where we in. We have really challenged that uh, and build up in the last few, in the last 15, 20 years. So we have a brand, uh, we have the skiers, we have a lot of Scandinavians here coming skiing. We have the Swiss skier that make holidays, that may come for a day skier. Um, we have people that come here for hiking. We have, uh, we have the Indian and group business, international business. So we have all year round, we have actually business coming. And that is the, the challenge that we have. We have the, our challenge is to keep new, a uh, new brand and uh, keep all the, the infrastructure very new. Our challenge, once again, we have uh, on one hand, uh, we have Quoni, for example, that uh, the changes are going on with the, the, the business internationally. Changes we had last year, especially the problem with the visa in, the, in China. Uh, they, had, they needed a visa and they only had a few center where they could go. Uh, also the terrorism that was in Europe that impacted them. Um, we also had India, for example, the, the economy that infla inflects us, so we're not only a local company in that way. And on the bottom, we have also Switzerland um, with the reduction, so they make new, uh, new products. Sorry. So for us, it's very important to keep on going with new products and new, uh, new infrastructure. Our, uh, our basic business has increased all the time. We're really happy with this development we have here. The last, in uh, 14 and 15, it was our absolute record year, year um, where we are but in still, we are still in line. But this is also because we invested in, in a lot of different uh, areas. We invested in one hand in, uh, in the snowmaking. Snowmaking is very important with the warm winter, late winter that we have. Um, we're still investing a lot. We built the snowmaking from the bottom. We have now increased further up. And we're still uh, in planning for uh, making really almost all the area in snowmaking in the, in the artificial snow so that we can ski. That's our USP that we can ski from October and our glacier. We start there till May. It's a very long season. Not the entire area, but uh, at least you can. We also um, invested into the hotels. Hotels is very important because they bring the Logiernechte, the, uh, the overnights. Overnights are necessary that you come to the mountain. And uh, so we are interested that, that we have. We had for this Titlis Resort, some of the people I was talking before for the Titlis Resort is one of our, was our, one of our projects to get overnight. Titlis Resort is a holiday uh, area resort. And then we have attractions, you see the road there and the cliff walk. Um, these are the attractions that people come here, that they're having an event here, they're, they're happy and uh, also for the non-skiers. If you look at the uh, we say it's gear days, erst ein dritte. That's every day that you come here into the area. Nevertheless, what you make in our area. So if you just go one head up. Um, we, this, uh, we, uh, we have three groups. We made three groups of, uh, of segments of the customers. 
We have the winter sport. Uh, we have the group business. This is mostly a international business. If you look at that, um, they're almost uh, 40%, like the skier business. Skier business is very stable. The group business is a little bit more developing at the moment. And we are happy that our individual business is also increasing. If I talk to about individual business, we have there from Swiss people that come hiking here in summertime, mountain biking. Um, it goes also to uh, international individual tourism that can be uh, Asian people, that can be near Middle East people. So it's, it's a very big mix where we have, but it's also increasing and really pushing on that, on this one. Uh, on this chart, you also can see that the snow business is a stable business. It's continuous. We keep on going with that. That's important because this is our base. The uh, group business from Asia is, uh, like you see, it's increasing, but uh, also it has some uh, international impact. When we go, where come the customers from? In our group business, they mainly come from China. We are very dependent on China. Or dependent on China. That's also why in our, uh, in the, just in the last year, we also had a decrease. The Chinese were uh, holding back because of the visa problem that they had of the ter terrorism. Uh, whereas the Indian, for example, they're not impacted by that. They didn't look at this in, in that way. Uh, um, for Chinese people, it's very important that they have their route to go through Europe. So we are dependent on what happens in Paris and, uh, and so on. If you go to the Indian, that's also interesting to know about our business. Is we have uh, in summertime we have hotel terrace goes into a Indian hotel. We change that really. We switch it from the normal winter tourism into the Indian. We have uh, Indian cooks there, uh, and it's really full of Indian group guests. So this is a very short char uh, chart uh, with the. Uh, segment for an individual tourist, the individual, individual travelers. If you look, look at the potential, you see that China has a very high potential. They have more and more people traveling. Um, we also see Germany, United States. Uh, interesting was last year, you could really see that also near Middle East was increasing. And this is actually our vision uh, triangle. We have at the very top, we have the titlis. Our This is our USP, the titlis. With the, uh, with the rot hair, um, it's skiing, it's sun, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the event at the top. You see the cash cows, how we call it? Here, we need good infrastructure. This means our business is a fixed cost. We need to uh, go have a good infrastructure and invest in that. Snowmaking, hotelry. Um, good restaurants, uh, and so on. And then we have the things, if they're not good, the hygienic factor, I think it's in English. Um, if they're not good, the people don't come, then they, miss, uh, they make them miss happy. Uh, so we're living after this, uh, after this triangle for us. We want to make the people happy here. So in the summary, it's we make people happy and well, I switched that. I always go with this. <laughs> I thank you very much. This is a short presentation of our company, who we are, and what we make. Thank you so much, Esther. Maybe just before you go, um, yeah. you could give some of the uh, non skiers a few tips on what, what the highlights are to do this afternoon after the meeting. Okay, yes. <laughs> Uh, we have on one hand, we have here the Trupse area, which is very nice. You can sledding down here, the, uh, the slopes. There's the um, like yeah. a tire. Like a tire where you can go in and, and touch and make a little, have a little bit of fun. For those one who want to go to the top, we have the Titlis, which is very interesting. We have an ice cave on the top. In the Titlis, Mount Titlis, you go up with the Rotter. First you go up with the Titlis Express, then to the Rotter. Um, you will be in the very nice scenic up there. Uh, there's the cliff walk. You can walk around and have a little bit of an impression of the nice mountain area where we're living. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. I think we don't need the computer anymore. Just... Okay.
Close the lid. <laughs> so let's let's get to the Q and A. Um, I've been wondering all week whether I'm going to be able to answer your questions, and uh, I guess we're about to find out. So if you'd like to ask a question, maybe just uh, approach the microphone. Um, and uh, I'm hoping there's going to be some questions, otherwise it's going to be a very short meeting. <laughs> Raima, would you like to uh, go to the microphone and... Then... <laughs> You just um, turn so that you can see that. Hello, my name is Rana Schultz. I, I have company listed in the German stock market. I started out in buying companies for one euro, and then I collected some cash, and with that I couldn't spend it on euros, euro deals anymore. So I started looking into the stock market. So since four years I've been investing in stocks, uh, and I've been going to ValueX, and uh, I met Robert and invested in him as a benchmark. And invested also in other funds, which I withdrew. He's the only one left. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm uh, now managing also. Uh, I'm doing a lot of public investment for myself, and I managed to beat the index in each year of my last four years. And I also invested directly in Engelbert at one stage. My question would be the obvious one Facebook is a highly valued company. It's not necessarily a um, value investment. And maybe um, you can explain a little bit more the rationale for doing a Facebook deal. Uh, that'll be interesting. Thank you. Great. Okay, I couldn't. <laughs> no. Um, you know, you're, you're perfectly correct that Facebook doesn't uh, doesn't really correspond to the traditional con concept of, of a value investment. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Ben Graham would be turning in his grave if he saw that. You know, company uh, a company trading on 25 times earnings, uh, which uh, which only came into existence maybe maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, you know, there's lots of lots of facets uh, to the investment, um, um, and uh, clearly, um, if you were to if you were to sort of check on a Bloomberg and look at uh, you know multiples from the very lowest rated companies to the very highest, then then Facebook would 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 for sure probably be be in the in the top half. Um, but uh, what I've come to realize over time is. Um, you know, I've made obviously lots of investments since I since I started started out, and um, some have been on very low multiples, some have been on, on very high multiples. But the, the investments that worked well were, were the companies uh, that worked well. And um, uh, for me, the most important thing is to find find companies which I'm super confident in, uh, primarily in terms of the people running them. I think that's uh, massively uh, underrated. Uh, simply because it's very difficult to quantify. Um, it's not a number you can put on. But I think when you have someone with a, with a strong vision, uh, a clear purpose, um, uh, and you're setting an example in a company which, which creates a culture, then that's, uh, that's an incredibly uh, pow powerful thing. And uh, what I also look to is, um, is a company which can, um, you know, I want to hold companies for a long time. So it's no, it's no good buying a company and then um, uh, you know, a couple of years uh, later, it's kind of run out of growth opportunity because then the, the kind of the logical thing, if the valuation is fair, to, to, is to sell it. So I look for companies which have a, a huge, uh, huge runway of, uh, of growth in front of them, and and that also seems seems to be the, the case with Facebook. Um, and so the third criteria is the price, and the, the price is for sure um, uh, not one which, which sets the pulse racing, if you like, things trading below book or, or trading on single digit, uh, single digit P's, um, but I don't think it's a, uh, it's a, a crazy price by, by any means uh, for a business of this, uh, of this quality. Um, it's, it's probably uh, based on, on this year's earnings, um, uh, trading at a small uh, premium to the market, but if you consider there's plenty of properties in it. Which aren't monetizing yet, so primarily uh, WhatsApp, uh, but to a certain extent uh, Instagram as well. Um, I think that relativizes uh, the valuation as well, and um, I think it's also rel relativized by um, uh, you know by the fact that the company is investing a lot for the long term in terms of uh, its uh, virtual reality platforms and artificial intelligence. So that obviously um, decreases uh, decreases current year earnings. <laughs> and you don't want to take a negative view of a company because it's investing for a long term. And that's effectively what you do if you start uh, ignoring companies because the earnings are a little bit depressed and that makes the PE higher. So um, if, I if I take all that together, um, uh, I, 
think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, investment opportunity. Um, for sure, in different stages of the market, there would be, uh, there would be better opportunities, uh, thinking back to 2009. But I think it's important to realize you have to take, uh, you take the opportunities uh, as they're presented and not, not based on, on, on what you wish for. And uh, I, think, uh, I think the investment's going to do very well for us. Stefan. Feel free, maybe uh, one or two people could, could queue up at the microphone, then we don't have a, a kind of too, too long a pause. But Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, Rob, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, it's great to see how you are uh, thriving after you know this the small start uh, that you had. Um, Thank you, uh, I run a little investment firm in, in Hamburg, and um, uh, we used to know each other when Rob was still a sales side uh, analyst. I have a question in relation to True Panion, mm -hmm. and uh, True Panion, uh, they have this sort of target business model which is roughly double the revenues they have right now. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, you know, take their business model and say they get there, uh, that would be, um, I think, 13 times earnings or so. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, since that is a few years out, valuation on True Panion, uh, when, you know, does it make sense still? Um, and, and the other point I want to ask, uh, I guess if somebody comes into your fund new now, um, they buy the portfolio, I guess. Well, how do you deal with the fact that some companies have gotten a lot more expensive than they were when you bought them? Yeah, so, so two, two, great, uh, two great sets of, uh, of questions. Let's see. Um, so on True Panion, it's primarily about valuation you wanted to, to talk about. Um, you know, so... Um, um, you know what? What I see in Trupanion is um, uh, a company which has, you know, a huge opportunity uh, ahead of it. Um, you know, uh, Trupanion uh, sells medical insurance for pets in uh, in the U.S. and it's a very under underpenetrated market there. So, uh, in the U.S., uh, there's about one percent of pets which are insured, and um, you know, in other countries such as the U.K. or Sweden, that number would be be closer to to thirty percent. Um, and so that's that's the that's the opportunity which uh, which lies ahead of them. And you know, there's reasons historically why penetration has been much lower in the U.S. You know, it was a much lower value product, the insurance one, and um, and, and there were also some some bad actors uh, selling you know selling not particularly great policies, which rightly put people off. Um, and of course, the amount of treatments uh, that, that are available for, for pets now is uh, are much wider. So you can get hip replacements, chemotherapy, and <laughs> Whenever I tell that to people, there's always one or, one or two two reactions. There's some people who, who love their pets, and of course there's chemotherapy. You know, what, why wouldn't there be? And then there's other people who say, why wouldn't you just buy a new dog? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I guess uh, I guess both I guess both views uh, exist, and you know, uh, they don't need to they don't need to win every single customer. Uh, or every single pet owner, but uh, you know the ones who do have a close relationship to their, their pet. Um, and so, you know, with True Panion, um, uh, the opportunity is is so large. I think um, uh, that the real question from an investment perspective is: uh, is it going to work or not? Uh, because it's still at a, a relatively young young age, and uh, there's things that work very well at the company. There's other things where they're still Really trying to trying to figure it out, uh, so it's a much earlier stage. It's much more much more upside than probably any other investment in the fund, um, and much more much more risk as well, uh, for that matter. And uh, you know, I was thinking about this when I made the investment in, in Facebook uh, a few months ago, and um, you know, of course, anyone who buys Facebook today is sort of banging their head against the wall of uh, you know why didn't I do this earlier? And um, you know, well. Uh, as nice as it would have been to have bought Facebook 10 years ago, um, I'm not sure you would have slept as well with the investment, at least in a concentrated portfolio, uh, as you would do today because so much of, of the business model is still, still being figured out. Um, and so although we now know it's worked spectacularly well, there, there's no reason uh, there, there's alternative uh, things that could have happened. And, uh, you know, so I kind of view True Panion as almost being like a, a kind of a company which is at a stage to where Facebook might have been if you'd invested five years ago. And, um, you know, I'm not sure I necessarily prefer 
the one to the other. Um, uh, I see the um, I see the, the much greater upside on, on a company like Trupanion, but I have a lot more more certainty about uh, um, the investment of, of Facebook, and so um, uh, it will be interesting for me to see how how the two investments work out. And, um, if uh, Trupanion were to work out uh, poorly, then for me that would be uh, an indication that it makes sense to maybe wait uh, for companies to be a little bit more mature in terms of their life cycle, even if that means the, the growth opportunity is a little bit lower. Um, but if, if it does well, then uh, you know, maybe uh, that's a sign that um, it is possible to identify these, these companies at a, maybe a slightly earlier stage than, than what Facebook is today. So I'm, I'm open-minded about how that works out and, uh, and we'll, we'll learn from, from whatever comes from it. And um, then the second part of your question was, you know, you know, we bought Trupanion uh, over a year ago. The price was uh, probably about half um, what it is today. Um, and, um, you know, but that's no use to, to someone who invests in the fund today. Uh, what we paid back then, uh, they're going to effectively be buying a stake in Trupanion. And for that matter, all, the, all of the other um, companies um, uh, at today's prices. And, um, uh, you know, that's a question I've struggled a lot with, uh, and I'm not sure I even today have, have the perfect uh, the perfect answer for it and it, it's it, it strikes me as such a such a difficult question it's it amazes me that I don't see it being being talked about uh, talked about more and um, you know uh, the way I manage money uh, so I had the kind of I think the fortune never to work to a, a traditional fund manager so I don't know how they do things and, and just do things from from pretty much from from first principles so what I would do with my own money and uh, you know, the way I used to manage my own money when it was separate, and how I do now through through the fund, is to um, uh, to, to 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 just uh, treat it like it's uh, treat it like it's it's my own money. And uh, when I buy something, I pay uh, a lot of attention to all the types of things you would expect me to look at, such as the quality of the management, the business, and, and all that kind of stuff. But having having built that confidence um, in the company. Um, uh, I don't then wake up every morning and, and question question the decision. I kind of view that then as a as a long term commitment to the to the people, and uh, and uh, I for sure I'm gonna start trading trading in and out of stocks at quarter end uh, based on new people coming into the into the fund or not. Um, so that isn't ideal for for new investors. Um, and so um, if I'm not gonna start trading trading aggressively, what what does that mean? Um, I, I think it means two things. You know, first of all, um, you know, there's obviously advantages, uh, huge advantages from investing with with someone who's basically managing their own money uh, next to yours. Um, but it's not a perfect uh, situation, and, and this is for sure one one disadvantage there is there. So people need to weigh up one against the other. Um, you know, the second point I think is, um, of course. For for new, for, you know, the, the the portfolio does sort of. Turn turn over uh, over time slowly slowly, but it does turn over, turn over. So so the longer you stay in the fund, the more you're kind of getting getting the true pennions at uh, at seven dollars rather than uh, sixteen dollars. So I think it's definitely an argument for for staying put for for a long time. Um, and the third thing, um, and this is um, I think probably the most most important point is I think I as a as a fund manager need to be much more. Kind of proactive about opportunities, opportunistically opening the clo and closing the fund, uh, depending on on where valuations are. Um, you know, I think funds tend to get closed when the manager says, uh, uh, you know, I have enough money uh, in the fund to 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 live well and uh, all that kind of stuff. And you know, that's clearly the wrong the, the wrong way to think about it. Uh, um, you know, the, the fund should be the fund should be closing when. Uh, uh, when it's unattractive for the customers, not when it's uh, unattractive for the manager. And uh, so that's something I intend to do much more um, proactively uh, going forward and, and, in fact, have been doing with people who've asked me whether they should invest. Um, um, you know, what I've been saying is, uh, you know, I think that now is not the right time. And there's there's going to be uh, better opportunities. And um, I'd, I'd much rather take investors in when there's a little bit of panic in the air. You know, because A, they're going to get a much cheaper price, um, which is which is great for them. But B, um, only a very particular type of investors go to invest when, they, when there's panic in the air. And that's basically an investor that really 
understands uh, Mr. Market and how he goes through his periods of depression and, and excitement and stuff. And those are the investors that are, and partners that, that, that I want. And I think um, only being open when there's a little bit of panic in the air is a great way to, to get investors to self-select. Hello, I'm, I'm Samuel Weber. I am an investor now since five years, and I founded a company with Stefan, who is also here. Um, one, one question that I really want to ask you is um, the question of, I totally get your reasoning that when you buy a business that earns 20%, then if you stay with that 10, 20 years, you will also earn those 20% no matter what price you pay. But I mean, there are many wonderful businesses out there that I would, that I would love to buy and also pay a premium but what i what i ask myself and what, what i want to ask you is if you're wrong you will get hit much harder if you paid a lot you know so what happens to your fund if you're wrong like on three different occasions at the same time for example what's kind of the worst case if you and i have like two red flags in in your fund for my for my standpoint that's credit acceptance one mm -hmm. and the second one was Novo Nordisk and I want to ask you how is this different outlook um, that Novo published this year affecting your valuation and your view of the company I, I think first you accept uh, you expected like 15 percent each year mm -hmm. and now it's five percent earnings increase and you paid 18 times earnings like a few years ago so how does that affect Okay, thank you. So, so if you, so I guess there was a there was a question in there about um, you know the risks of paying a high multiple for a company if um, if subsequently the, the development is poor, um, and then there were two questions about you know, should we be invested in credit acceptance of Nova? So is that a fair summary? Just, just um, Nova actually how the change in outlook. Affects. Okay, just Nova. Just Nova. Okay. Yes. Um, so um, no, I've lost my train of thought. The, the the first one again was. <laughs> and well, there was entry price. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so entry price. So, you know, one of the things I, I kind of realized is that if you're wrong, you're wrong, right? <laughs> you're not, uh, you're, you're not, um, it's not like getting a, a company which is on a low PE wrong is uh, somehow, somehow uh, less painful than, than getting one <laughs> on, a, on a high PE, uh, leaving, leaving all other things uh, uh, equal. And, um, uh, you know, and, and especially on the kind of the lower quality companies, uh, you know, the real risk is that, that uh, you know, earnings disappear completely and uh, if there's leverage, then, then, then the losses can really be, uh, can be high. So, you know, I think a kind of a prerequisite of being a stock picker and in particular being a, a concentrated stock picker is that you think you kind of get things right uh, more, often, more often than not. And, um, you know, assuming, assuming uh, that's the case, um, you know, what you really want to focus on is the ideas where they, uh, you know, the certainty uh, is the highest. Um, and so what I, really, what I really look for is kind of certainty uh, about my ideas. And, um, uh, you know, what, what I've tended to find is um, if, if, I'm, if I'm very sure about something and it's tended to work and... Um, uh, and what's also really great is, of course, as anyone who's ever invested in, in companies knows, occasionally they they get really beaten up. And um, when they get beaten up, there's always a helpful broker or, or friend on hand to explain why it's all of a sudden become a crappy company. Uh, maybe that's a part of it. You know, maybe that's a good thing to carry over to the Novo uh, discussion. But there's always plausible reasons when a company is uh, the stock price is getting beaten up, um, why that perhaps should be the case. And uh, you know the big money is made when everyone is panicking, and uh, you're at the very least not selling, but ideally, of course, uh, buying. And the crucial thing then is um, is to really be to be certain of what what you're doing. And so, you know, I much prefer paying a little bit more for something I'm I'm sure of than um, paying less for for something I'm, I'm less sure of. Um, and I I guess what what that's saying is that. The multiple per se is not what's providing the margin of safety. Um, it's the the quality of the people and, and the quality of the business. Um, you know, so uh, then um, then moving on to Novo. So um, you know, Novo was uh, has been um, you know has had a had a terrible year stock market wise. Uh, I'm not sure it's been 
quite such a disastrous year uh, business-wise. Uh, we don't know the earnings yet, but most likely they, they grew. Uh, the company's paid a dividend and uh, there's a certain amount of uh, uncertainty about next year, but um, uh, you know, there's uncertainty for every company next year. <laughs> um, probably the company with the least uncertainty is Novo because it's completely uncyclical. <coughs> you know, if you're a diabetic, you require uh, insulin completely irrespective of uh, what the economy is doing, what, uh, what Mr. Trump is saying, or, or anything else that matters. So while there is a certain amount of uncertainty, and I'm happy to, to talk about that, um, the, the uncertainty is far higher on nearly every company uh, in the stock exchange. And the reason we're not talking about the uncertainty at, at uh, you know, all the other companies is, is because the share price isn't, uh, isn't down as much. And so, you know, I think um, uh, I think it's almost a, uh, although understandably, when a company's share price is down, people want to talk about what's going wrong. I think that, uh, that's a kind of a, there's a big risk entail to that of actually being very pro-cyclical and, um, uh, and effectively, you know, following Mr. Market, you know, being effectively a, uh, an intellectual Mr. Market follower. So not, not panicking blindly, but, but panicking thoughtfully. <laughs> Uh, both kind of kind of uh, lead, lead to the to, to the same outcome. Um, so um, you know, um, you know. I guess the question was, you know, what do I think about the valuation now? And, um, and I, I guess there was also a question there about about the fund and stuff. And um, you know, one, one of the things actually, although of course I, I prefer um, people not to be uh, so pessimistic about Novo, but it kind of um, one of the things that um, People often ask me running a, a concentrated portfolio because it's very unusual and people people who have been to any kind of financial class have generally heard they should be diversified and that's the, the key thing. And, um, you know, be, having a concentrated portfolio is, is often considered to be an incredibly risky thing. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of, um, if I look at last year, I think that's kind of been shown not really to be the case. Um, you know, we had an outcome, you know, Novo was a very large position in the fund. I forget the exact amount, probably. I guess about 13 or 14 percent at the start of the year, less now. <laughs> um, and we had an outcome which, I mean, who on earth would have thought, uh, you know, in a, in a year where, you know, the market is going to be up. You know, if I was to tell you at the start of last year, the market is going to be up uh, around 10 percent. Um, uh, what do you think is going to happen to Novo? And, and as I'm feeling generous, I'm even going to tell you there's not going to be any kind of disruption to the medicine or anything like that, you know, what, what do you think of worst case scenarios? You know, I think uh, most people would have, uh, most people would have thought, uh, you know, a 10 or 20% minus would be a, a pretty extreme case. And as we now know, the, the stock nearly lost uh, half of its value uh, last year. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And it's, uh, it's a reminder how, how humble we should be in, in terms of uh, uh, our expectations. You know, but nevertheless, uh, despite this disappointing outcome, you know, the flat, the fund was more or less flat, flat for the year. Um, you know, so um, I'm disappointed. Uh, I prefer to have, uh, prefer for the investors to be uh, seeing a positive result on on uh, on their investments. Um, but you know, there was certainly not the farm bet on on that company or, or any other company, and, and we're perfectly able to to withstand that type of uh, um, um, that type of uh, outcome and. We even we're even able to to withstand accumulation of those type of outcomes, um, um, partly in terms of the way the fund is set up. You know, there's no leverage, so that's uh, an enormous uh, enormous help. But also in terms of the the investor base. So I didn't receive any panicked call from investors say asking me what on earth we were doing with Novo, or for sure didn't have any redemptions or anything like that. So we're well set up to to, to withstand those types of. Uh, shocks and I, I think that's a that's a big competitive advantage. Michael. Michael from Linux. You are managing a small fund in Linux. I have a follow-up question on that. Um, can you talk about how you're thinking about increasing your investment uh, uh, in your renewable because uh, you know now the price is half and if you're still and you're writing your letter you still think if that's a crisis then you like more of those. Um, so <laughs> What are your criteria to decide in a focused fund on now investing more and doubling up on Novo, for example? I'm not asking whether you would do it, just yeah. conceptually. Yeah, so um, 
you know, as a value investor, um, you know, when, when, when th things are cheap, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, that's actually what, what pays the bills. <laughs> if things never got cheap and never people never turned, uh, turned pessimistic, we wouldn't really have, uh, have a job to do. So, um, you know, so that's, um, you know, that's a, that's a good thing. And, and we did actually substantially increase our, uh, our share in Novo um, last year. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I don't have any constraints in the fund in terms of uh, how con concentrated it is. Um, but I want to be mindful that um, although I want to be concentrated, I don't want to be too concentrated. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, um, uh, we had a very large stake at the, the beginning of the year. Uh, we added to that uh, uh, later on in the year. So, um, you know, there's quite a substantial amount of capital in there. And um, I think I'd be reluctant to put, put more to work uh, uh, as of as of today. Um, but, uh, you know, who, who knows what prices show up. And uh, um, if something happens, then, uh, um, you know, ready and willing to act. Yeah, sure. My name is Robin Brestic. <laughs> um, my name is Robin Brestic, and um, I'm a private investor from Frankfurt. It's Tommy's fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he promised me he was going to take care of the mics. I can't believe it. <laughs> just don't go um, yeah, I'm a private investor from Frankfurt. I'm not investing in your fund right now, but I'm thinking about it. And um, so thank you very much for having me here and giving me the opportunity as a non-investor in the business owner fund. And I have a couple of questions um, regarding yeah, how you approach your invest, uh, investments and um, what kind of criteria, criteria you use for buying your investments. I know uh, from the readings um, of your letters that you have those four big criteria. Mm -hmm. But could you break it a little bit further down for me, please? Um, me as an investor, I wasn't was looking so much uh, at the managerial uh, criteria, for example. And I want to understand if you have a criteria list, for example, that you kind of go through and say, okay, yes, this is a teaser management, and yes, um, he has been sticking to what he said in the, in the past, and those kind of things. Um, and I would like to know if you, when you have an investment, if you work kind of like this. I know not every investment is the same and there is no one size fits all kind of criteria list, but do you have something like this in place? And um, in addition to that, I would like to know if you um, update those criteria on a regular basis. And I assume when we once met in Frankfurt and you said, yeah, I'm, I'm broadening my horizon and I want to get to know more companies and increasing my opportunity set, then this will become a lot work to do. It will become more and more if you want to update all the, the numbers, for example, on an annual basis or whatever. So that would be my second question. Um, okay, there's a few maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I can answer. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm probably have forgotten them, I'm afraid. But, uh, <laughs> especially the difficult ones. <laughs> the, the, last, the last one is, is just, um, uh, a question that kind of came up right now, and when you said um, you probably wouldn't recommend uh, a potential investor uh, to invest into your fund at any time, and I remember when you wrote about your, um, your, your philosophy on, on holding cash, mm -hmm. um, and I agree with that, and that would kind of contradict what you just said, because if I have a non-investor in your fund right now and I'm holding cash position, um, yeah, it doesn't make sense. I should invest into your fund. Even right now, even when you think uh, maybe investors should hold back and maybe there's a panic and the market says uh, everything is, is, is turning bad and then would be a right time to invest into your fund. But, well, uh, you, on the other hand, you said holding cash and trying to time the market is maybe not the right thing to do. So that kind of doesn't go together in my theory right now. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're you're, you're absolutely right to, to point out that there's a certain certain contradiction uh, in there, and uh, um, and uh, there's not really much I can say to take that away, um, other than just to point out that there's kind of a 
as a kind of a contradiction in, in not every morning waking up and seeing what your best opportunities are and, and changing the, the, the composition of the fund. Um, uh, mathematically speaking, that would be, be the rational thing to do. Um, it's just that we know that um, people who kind of trade their stocks every day uh, over time just generate a lot of cost and end up uh, owning too many things they don't understand so well. So although it's, it's not a perfect way to do things, um, it, I think it's probably uh, probably the best way to do things is, is being a long, is a long term holder. Um, and, um, you know, you're right that um, if I were to take the portfolio today, um, I, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, over the next five years, it will do quite a lot better than cash. So if someone's sort of sitting on a, on a pile of cash and wondering whether they should be investing in, in, in my fund or somebody else's fund, then they're probably better off, uh, they're probably better off in the fund. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I love my investors to have a great experience and, and, and clearly they're going to have a much better experience if, if, they, if they get in at a, um, at a time when, um, when there's a little bit of uh, panic in the air. And I also love the idea of it so it's a kind of a way of, of getting, getting the right type of investor to, to self-select. So, um, you know, I haven't really I'm thought this right through to, to the very end, but that's kind of where, where my thinking is and uh, uh, that's kind of how I, how I think about it. Yeah. Okay, and the first one? <laughs> the other thing is basically about your, your kind of oh, the criteria, yeah. criteria yeah. when you buy it. Yeah, so, um, um, you know, there's there's basically four criteria I have, whereby the first one kind of, do I understand the business? That's kind of, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the most important one in terms of kind of weeding stuff out. So if, if someone starts telling me about some wonderful company that's found a, a way to make chewing gum, uh, the taste of chewing gum taste last longer in your mouth or or a new uh, a cure for cancer or something, I, I, I kind of feel my eyes glaze over and I, I kind of lose interest quickly because I notice uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I don't understand that and I'm not going to be able to, to invest in that type, type of business. So, um, you know, the first one is understanding and that's sort of dealt with pretty quickly and that leaves the three main ones, which is um, uh, a management, which I think uh, I can trust and, and which has a certain amount of uh, talent. Um, a great business, which is going to earn um, good returns over a long period of, uh, of time and, um, and, and finally a, a, an attractive price and um, so if I, if I take those three things together um, I kind of got the feeling you were, you were looking for lots of different ways I was looking to, to find that um, but actually it's, it's the other way around I'm, you know, my, my hypothesis on any company which I'm spending any amount of time on by definition is yes this is a great business yes this is a uh, uh, an honest management and uh, well maybe not the price is attractive because I'm happy to look at a company's just for the future but um, if I was thinking of investing uh, it would be yes the price is attractive <coughs> and then the kind of the, the analytical work that needs to be done is then to, to dispr disprove that hypothesis and so um, if the hypothesis is that the management is honest then I need to start digging into to that management's past um, uh, you know how has it behaved uh, in the past? How has it communicated to investors? In particular, how has it communicated in difficult times? Um, you know, in 2009, uh, it's important to see what how management has done. Um, and um, all, all kinds of stuff like that. And, and, and there as well, a lot of times uh, I have to give up on an idea. So if, if I'm looking at a management that wasn't really um, active or already recently joined the business for a couple of years, then there's just not enough data really for me to to analyze, to, to, to figure out if they are going to be good guys or not. Um, I take a slightly different view of that if they've, if they've you know, there's been a long-term CEO and he, he finds a replacement, then I'll, I'll give that person the benefit of the doubt. But if it's a, if it's a new idea, then I, I need a long, a long data period. To, to <coughs> um, so it's really a process of actually trying to disprove the hy hypothesis rather than really trying to, to prove it. Is there anything I missed there? Yeah, the okay. criteria. The other two criteria. Um, um, well, so that, that was more kind of a, yeah, so, you know, ditto for, for the other two criteria. Well, in particular, the, the, the management, uh, sorry, the, uh, the business quality. I'm, I'm looking for disproving, uh, disproving information. Um, it's, it's, it's any company you can look at and within a few seconds say, you know, put up the hypothesis that it has some motor or another. If it's a small company, you can say it dominates its niche. It's niche. If there's a 
Um, if it's a large company, you can say it's got an economy of scale or whatever. So you you know you can very quickly put together a hypothesis. Um, you know the tricky thing is actually then to to work out whether you have strong conviction in because the conviction is essential because you know investing is actually more of an, an emotional than a than an intellectual game. And you know the tricky thing is to have the courage of your convictions when everyone else is panicking. And the way to to do that is to to really do your work and, and make sure you're you're certain of an idea before before you invest in it, and um, uh, and so so you really need to be to be pretty sure um, in order to win the emotional game, uh, not, not necessarily the intellectual game. Um, but, you know, one thing I would also say because I, I got the feeling your question was a little bit aiming towards kind of changes and, and stuff. So, although the kind of the three criteria uh, uh, are the same and, and probably always will be. Um, there's lots of different ways of and different types of management ability or, or business quality um, and ways of looking at evaluation. <coughs> there's also different weights one can give to these different criteria. So, you know, when I when I started out, I paid attention to to management, um, but I don't think I gave it anything like the the importance that I do today. And um, you know, so the kind of the re you know, if the ingredients are always the same, the recipe is kind of changing. And I try to document that in my letters so people can um, can follow what I'm, you know, how I'm sort of changing my thinking and, and can you know make a uh, an intelligent decision for themselves whether they like the direction it's going or whether they think it's kind of drifting away from what they originally signed up for. Um, but I, I really view investing as a kind of an intellectual journey of uh, um, there's always new companies to learn about and new ways of seeing companies and new insights you can gain and. You know, I love that kind of process of learning and, and iteration, and uh, you know, I love the journey. And um, I think the journey is interesting when um, you know, sort of doing things a little bit differently over time and refining how you do things, and um, and that's very much part of you know the journey you can expect as as investors. The the types of companies, uh, the sectors I've invested in, the countries I've invested in, have been changing over time. The, the weight I give to things like um, you know, management and culture at a company at Facebook has uh, obviously increased versus, you know, a few years ago where probably on a valuation basis that wouldn't have made it into the portfolio. So, so things are kind of changing. I hope in the in the right direction, um, but I think they're pretty small incremental changes, and I'm open-minded that not every change will be a good one. And if something doesn't work out well, then uh, um, it won't kill us, and uh, I'll just learn from that and do things a little bit differently next time. Hi, um, so I'm Shandan Dube, and uh, I work for Google. I'm not an investor yet, but I'm planning to uh, be a future investor. Um, so most of my questions were answered. Uh, what I'm wondering is, um, I have read all your letters, but I've never actually um, read any or what you think about. So you have a benchmark, which is that. But I don't exactly know if you're targeting to be um, Performing in the absolute terms, like okay, you're targeting like 10% of the year, or you are trying to target like trying to beat the MDEX, like how you think about the performance aspect of it. Um, especially because uh, in the last letter, at least, the worrying part for me was that you say, okay, I'm paying 24 multiple on Facebook, but um, you have to always consider other opportunities in the market that are available. So, in that comparison, it's, uh, it's not a huge multiple to, to, to pay. And that kind of um, worries me a little bit because this is how kind of I understand that you have a perspective that it is growing and hence the price is justified. But then you do argue that because the rest of the market is also trading at very high multiples, this kind of um, this is opportunity that that you have been given, and we should look at that. And this is worrying in the sense that I feel like this is how bubbles are created. Like I feel like at some point you should say, okay, the margin of safety, even if I understand the management is also. Awesome. And the company is growing very quickly and stuff like this. There is a, it's a risky proposition, nevertheless. What is risky? So at some point, you have to have like a limit to say, okay, I'm never going to pay more than 20 times for it or something. You know, understand what I mean? Like, in that absolute kind of sense. And um, I would, and that goes, I mean, if you don't invest, then you have cash, right? So that kind of plays with that. So um, 
I don't think I made my talk clear. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, you know, so it's important to remember that, um, um, you know, when, when you're investing, you have to kind of, um, you know, you have to kind of take the world as it is and, and not how, how you would like it to be. And there's, there's basically an opportunity set of investments out there. And that includes, of course, every listed stock company, but it also includes cash and it also includes, uh, you know, government bonds and long-term government bonds. And there isn't really a, a zero position. Um, uh, you're always going to have to make an active decision to be in one of those. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, um, you know, when cash was sort of giving you a 6% uh, return and uh, you felt, you know, that maybe stocks were, you know, multiples were approaching, you know, 15, 20 times, you know, you would look at that and think, well, cash looks much more attractive than, uh, than bonds and stuff, and, uh, rather than, uh, than the stocks. Um, you know, but today um, there isn't really too many, there isn't really a kind of a zero, no risk position. I think um, uh, cash is definitely not my definition of a risk-free place to park your money for, you know, the next few years. Um, it's returning nothing at a time when there's, there's clearly inflation, um, at least in the things uh, that uh, most people pro probably want to buy, uh, like property and uh, that kind of stuff. And um, there's, a, there's the risk of world of crazy things happening. Uh, yeah, I never thought I would experience it, but I was, uh, I was in India uh, in November visiting companies, and I think it was about the third day of the trip. Um, well, let me start by saying in, in India, uh, there's not really much in the way of credit cards, so uh, everything you have to pay for in cash. <coughs> so last thing I wanted to be was sort of you know, short of money um, while I'm sort of in this uh, unfamiliar country. So I went to the, uh, the ATM and took the maximum amount I could. <laughs> and uh, the ATM very kindly uh, spat out lots of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. And uh, uh, when I got to when I got back to my hotel in the evening, um, uh, it was going over the news that as of midnight, five hundred and rupee notes and one thousand rupee notes were, were going to be worthless. <laughs> and this is the kind of stuff you only read about in books of uh, you know kind of the money in your in your wallet suddenly becoming worthless. But it, it kind of happened, and that's uh, you know to the extent I was skeptical about cash. <laughs> Uh, I still am. So, um, you know, I don't think cash is, is a good place to park your money. Um, you know, long-term government bonds clearly are a great place to park your money, you know, effectively yielding close to zero for the best, the best quality uh, uh, governments uh, at a time when spending is out of control and governance, uh, uh, you know, especially with the EU, uh, everyone seems to think someone else is responsible. Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't think long-term government bonds are, uh, are an option. So that kind of leaves you, that leaves you with the stock market. And, um, you know, I, I weigh up uh, all the different opportunities that I feel are in my circle of competence, and which I know well enough to make an investment in. And, uh, you know, I weigh them up, like I mentioned, uh, across the criteria of, um, you know, the quality of the business and its opportunity, and um, how much trust and confidence I have in the management. Um, and that kind of wheel, wheel, wheels, wheels it down to a, to a certain amount. And then, uh, you know, it's ultimately a kind of a question of, of valuation. And, you know, with valuation, you have to, um, you know, here too, it's, uh, it's not the, what you would want to pay. It's, um, it's the best opportunity amongst all the different, uh, you know, amongst the opportunity set that's there. So you have to weigh everything up against uh, everything else. And if I look at the market today, I see very, very few companies, um, at least the ones I look at, trading on much below 20 times earnings. And many of those are, are growing GDP at best, uh, cyclical. Um, uh, you know, I don't see a huge amount of opportunity in them, to be honest. And then, uh, you know, I take a Facebook, which may be modestly more expensive, if at all. Um, and, um, and with all these wonderful things going on for it in terms of the opportunities that lie ahead of it, there. The people managing it, the the culture of the company, and I think it's uh, I think it's actually pretty close to a no-brainer. Hello. Hi, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Hegarty. I'm um, an investor in the fund since inception, luckily enough. At least in the past, um, I also have a small um, software business in Switzerland. <clears throat> I'm, I'm I'm not a finance professional. 
Okay, neither am I. So I have a, a generic question for which I have a, a case in point. Um, but the, que the question is basically about the conundrum of management, um, well, basically share buybacks mm -hmm. together with management payouts, selling their stock, um, and the valuations of companies, and then the conflict of interests, which can, which can be um, in this mix, basically bringing yes. in, basically bringing in point um, um, the management integrity. Yeah. So fortunately, the case in point is not Goldman Sachs here, mm -hmm. but the case in point is Novo Nordisk, mm -hmm. um, which has been discussed earlier. And this is something which I haven't done the forensic analysis on, so it will remain a sort of generic question. But basically, within the last 12 months, there were two steps down in, in, the, in the growth forecast from 15 to 10, 10 to 5. Mm -hmm. um, and for the last two years that I know of, uh, Northern Nordisk have done um, share buyback schemes that have run for the duration of the year and there's one still running and then all, all likelihood there might be another one about to start. And so we have a, a question here about the management. At the start of a year where they go on to reduce growth forecast that they do share buybacks and I assume also would be redeeming their own stock and within this year there was a change at the top of the company. A change of management. Mm -hmm. So, how do you reevaluate the the, um, the management integrity? Yeah. So, is it more kind of a generic question about kind of stock options and buybacks in general, or more more specifically to the? It's it's um well it's it's a generic question, but with one okay. fun okay. case point. Um, you know, so you know the, the important thing is um, you're kind of looking for you're looking for you know in, integrity uh, and management and in 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 all respects. So, there's lots of different ways to compensate and uh, and all that kind of stuff um, but the, the you know the really important thing is that it kind of it makes sense and um, you know hopefully everybody is, is, is getting rich together um, so that's kind of what I look for in a big picture way um, in a compensation scheme um, you know specifically to Novo uh, you know I think it's really been an exemplary company over the years um, uh, in terms of how it sort of uh, allocates its capital um, so um, you know, perhaps you're, you're not aware of, but um, you know, Novo's had the policy pretty much forever of returning all of its cash to the shareholders, um, and they've been able to do that um, despite growing very rapidly, uh, because um, you know the, the business requires very very little capital, uh, given due to the way the rebate scheme works in the in the U.S. They effectively get to keep a lot of cash um, on their balance sheet, which they return to the uh, to the insurance companies at the end of the year. And that has effectively allowed them to grow without um, without really absorbing much in the way of capital. And um, you know what they do with that capital is return it you know, more or less 100% to the, to the shareholders. And I think that's pretty much the best case scenario. And the way they do that is they return about half in the for, in the form of dividends, and they do half in the form of share buybacks. Um, now the way they approach share buybacks is simply to um, mandate a, an investment bank. Um, Presumably at the start of the year, to they say that you know they, they obviously they, um, they they disclose what the the size of the buyback is, and then they're in the market every day uh, simply buying back uh, stock. And uh, there's no management intervention, so um, there's no kind of um, uh, oh we're heading for a bad year, let's dial it back or uh, or anything anything like that, which would be a little bit you know tricky. Um, now obviously that's not the the very best. Way to do a share buyback. The very best companies, um, you know, credit acceptance springs to mind. Uh, do share buybacks very opportunistically. They they wait, and wait, and wait, and when the share price is cheap, they return huge amounts of stock. Now that's that's obviously uh, that's obviously a superior way to approach things. <coughs> but um, you know, uh, you can't find perfection in every investment, and you have to weigh different factors up against others. You know. Uh, I much prefer cap credit acceptances, capital allocation to Novo, although I love Novo's uh, <coughs> approach. Um, you know, credit acceptance, for example, is a much more cyclical company um, and, and probably riskier company than Novo. So there's there's different different things you have to weigh up against the other. But if every portfolio, uh, every company in the portfolio approach to capital allocation the way Novo does, that would be fine by me. Thanks. Thanks. Good morning. 
Hi, Rob. Hi, Bar. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for hosting me today. Uh, I've been learning a lot from your letters, and this is another great opportunity. Um, I started my uh, investment company two years ago based on the advice Rob gave me, basically because the value for the investment managers that I admired didn't really want to hire me. So I started out on my own. Um, and, uh, if, ever, if ever I need a number two, you're, you're first on the list. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got two questions where I think I can, I can still learn a lot. Uh, one is on selling, um, because uh, investment managers like yourself who have a high conviction and do a lot of research and really know the companies in and out and have an admiration for the management. Um, we sort of get attached to those companies mm -hmm. and we have a lot of invested in them um, because they're great companies and they have that type of management. We think these things are rare. Right? So we tend to stay with them. Um, but at the same time, I struggle with the fact that you know every year when I look at stocks in the universe, they go up or down 50 to 70 percent from the bottom tip to the mm -hmm. highest point. So I think, okay, there's a lot of opportunity and mispricing going on in the market. I love this company. I really am a fan of that management. And long term, I believe in this stock. Um, and uh, I struggle to say, okay, when is the right time to say no? Uh, all the emotions and uh, conviction that I have with that versus the opportunity that exists elsewhere because of mispricing. How do you, and I would like to know how you balance those. Do you have a threshold where you say no? Typically, I have to stay with this company for a very long time. But now I see a, a company that uh, is trading just way below the mispriced way below. And then I have a question regarding that. Okay, so let, let me take that first. Um, so that's probably the, the, the question I get. Um, most often, uh, especially from, from very thoughtful people that kind of look look about look how I invest and <clears throat> agree with a lot of uh, how I do things, but but there they, they kind of struggle. Um, so, um, you know, first of all, you know, I do sell things. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I sold Baidu uh, last year, for example. And um, you know, the main reason I'll sell something is if I kind of think I maybe have made a mistake. So I'm looking for kind of, um, you know, the, the hypothesis for every company I, I invest in is that, you know, this is a great company with, uh, with wonderful managers and um, a huge opportunity in front of it. And then, of course, sometimes uh, information uh, crops up, which is sort of uh, disconfirming. Um, so, you know, in the case of Baidu, I was very disappointed about the way they'd um, uh, been handling their medical search business and, and, and probably some of the other businesses as well. And when that happens, uh, I, I sell in an instant. And uh, um, well, actually, I, I took a few months before I, I reached a, a decision. But um, I'm, I don't feel wedded to to, to the position or, or to what I might have said about the company in the past. I think everyone understands if a mistake is made, it needs to be uh, it needs to be corrected. Um, you know, so that's a that's a really good reason to sell something. And then sometimes people ask me. And I think that's where your question was heading. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's clear. That's all very well. But what if you buy this company and it's got a great management and this wonderful opportunity and you're right and it compounds at 15, 20% a year over five years and then it becomes too expensive. And <laughs> I'm like, I'll take that problem. <laughs> Um, you know, that's really, um, that's really a luxurious problem to have is, you know, all these companies where... Yeah, the analysis has been 100% right, and uh, you know, the share price has appreciated two or three hundred percent. Then uh, that's kind of not my definition of a risk. That's actually <laughs> my definition of a of a process, which has which has worked well. Thank you very much. And that's of course right. But I wanted to know: Do you have a threshold where you say, you know, I think with the appreciation that the stock has done, um, now my expected yeah. return going forward is X. And maybe I have something that is doing X plus five. And although I really believe still in the long term picture of this company and the modes and the management, yeah. here I'm getting maybe X plus five percent. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to switch. Do you have a threshold where you? Yeah, yeah. I think your your I think your question almost kind of contains the answer, which so I think you're on the right track. So I mean, ultimately, it always comes a little bit back to to kind of opportunity cost. And um, you know, if I have. Um, and I think about these things in a very big picture way. I don't have a detailed DCF, which is sort of jumping around. And, and But in a very big picture way, if I have a company in the portfolio 
which is substantially more highly valued than uh, another one and perhaps has uh, you know, an inferior uh, growth outlook or in, in other respects of the, the, the investment hypothesis, it's, uh, it's inferior. And I think it's you know, obviously the rational thing to do is to change from, from, from the one to the other. But um, it has to be very clear, though. You know, as we, as everybody knows who's uh, ever uh, invested in, in the stock exchange, kind of your expectations in terms of a company's earnings power can be can be very wrong. And the good thing is, if the analysis about the company and the business is right, um, it's very wrong in the right direction. So it tends to work out way better uh, uh, than you thought. So I would be very hesitant to sell one thing because I thought I was getting something I know less well. You know, maybe a slightly cheaper PE or, um, uh, or whatever the metric is. Um, but if something is really very obvious, um, then I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good reason to sell. Yeah. Then just a final technical question uh, on FX. I, I believe, I didn't study it well enough, but I believe uh, you do not hedge in, in uh, for example, against the US dollar moves. And as a conviction manager, you have big positions in, in, the, in the US markets. Um, and this is a what if question. So if, if your um, base reference currency wasn't the euro, but was a more stronger currency like the Swiss franc, um, and uh, you had maybe portfolio companies that had a business model that was more local, not that global in nature, uh, how would you go about thinking about hedging in, in this environment where hedging comes with the cost? Okay, okay, so. Uh... That, that's something I've really given almost no thought to. And I, I really think it's, um, actually it reminds me of, uh, I think Chandan had a question earlier, which I, I forgot to answer. He was talking about kind of benchmarks and how do I think about benchmarks and, and that kind of stuff. And, and I guess if you work at a professional fund management organization, something you think a lot about is, you know, what is my benchmark? How, do, how is my portfolio stacked up against that benchmark? And what, am I, what are my competitors doing? Am I... Uh, do I have a big uh, difference in allocations from my competitors? Because I don't mind being crap as long as everyone else is crap, because then I'm not going to get fired. And I would put kind of the hedging question a little bit in that in that uh, in that pot as well. So it's probably something that um, uh, um, that, that people who you know in the fund management industry think a lot about: should it be a euro class fund, a dollar class? Should it be hedged or unhedged, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, I, I just don't give any thought to that, to be honest. Um, maybe that's naivety because I was never in, in the industry. But you know, the way you you manage your own money, if if you're enthusiastic about a company and you think it's going to increase its value uh, at a huge uh, or a large rate over a long period of time, you know, I don't think top of mind is, you know, should I be hedging my my dollar exposure or or, or something like that. Um, and, and in in any case, uh, if I look at the companies in the portfolio. Um, I'm not even sure how you would go about hedging it, as a lot of them have earnings from all over the world. Uh, in any case, you know, Novo is listed in Danish Corona, um, probably has almost zero, um, probably less than five percent of its business in, in Danish Corona. The US is actually much by far the biggest uh, business for them. Um, you know, BMW, which we don't own any longer, but um, you know, there too, you know, it's a kind of Euro company, a German company, but made a lot of its profits in China, which is kind of linked to the US dollar and the US as well. So, um, um, you know, if I, I mean, if, maybe an interesting question is what if it was a kind of a very weak sort of emerging market type type currency? Um, and even then I, I wouldn't hedge, but um, what I would look to is if my assumption on inflation um, in, in a country is, let's say for example, 10%, then, um, you know, if the company is compounding at 10% a year, or, or if its return on equity is 10% a year, then it's impossible to make any real returns from that. So um, to, to stack up well against a, a company in a, a developed market, which is making, which is compounding at 15% a year, something in a 10% in a per year inflation country needs to be growing at least 25% a year just to, to kind of offset that. So that's the kind of way I, I think about it. Uh, but I wouldn't, I don't think I would ever uh, lose, lose time and effort on hedging stuff. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Nick Chesley, um, here from uh, MIT's endowment. My colleague Martin Harris from RMC as well. I have two unrelated questions, but since there's two of us here, I'll <coughs> ask them both. 
Um, both of them are designed to be sort of answer from first principles. It's not that we're critical of any business in the portfolio today. Um, the first is you've written thoughtfully about um, the difference between a sustainable moat and a growing moat, and that being a function of an innovative culture and an innovative management team. And I'm curious how you think about the inputs to innovation and how you think about underwriting innovation beyond culture and talent and management. Um, also in the context that, it, and perhaps this is naive, but it seems that a lot of innovative companies work in very fast moving industries, mm -hmm. often technology. But how do you feel about the capacity to have certainty five, 10 years out um, when innovation is a critical part of the thesis? So that's the first part. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the second is when you think about very mature businesses, take Facebook as an example, 380 billion market cap, a quarter of the world's population uh, is counted among the monthly active users. I think it's like a $1.6 billion number. Mm -hmm. How do you think generally about the law of large numbers being a headwind to compounding and duration? <coughs> is it possible for Facebook to be a one point? $5 trillion dollar business or Google and others and how do you weigh that runway versus certainty when you're looking at larger companies? <laughs> Thank you, two, two really great uh, yeah. <laughs> two really great questions. Um, yeah, so you know uh, on, on the kind of the um, you know the kind of the question of moat and, and, and innovation, you know I think it's kind of almost stating the obvious um, although it took me a while to, to get, get to it but it's kind of if you think about it, um, really not all that important whether a company has a wide moat or a narrow moat. It certainly needs a moat. Um, but the really crucial thing is, is that moat uh, kind of expanding faster than other people are filling it up? Because I'm looking to be invested for a very long time. So even if even if a moat was, a moat was only eroding at a, you know say five percent a year, that would still mean. Um, um, over um, you know over ten years or so, a large part of that moat has, has disappeared. So you know, I really think um, the kind of um, the idea of widening is, is way more important than than, than width. And um, that sounds kind of obvious, and I see some of you kind of nodding your head. Um, but I think it's actually kind of fairly non-obvious, um, at least within the context of kind of the value investing literature and, and how a lot of uh, value investors work. Um, and I think the, the approach a lot of value investors uh, uh, take, which, by the way, of course, are the, the very finest investors, but is that you know, innovation. Well, you know, that's not my, that's not my, uh, that's not really in my ballpark. That's uh, something I don't really understand, and uh, I'm going to leave to to other people to worry about. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna focus on these sort of theoretically non-changing businesses, um, and you know, leave leave the tough stuff to the other guys. And, um, you know, I think that's a I think that's a, a problematic way to, to approach things because I don't think there's too many businesses left that, that fit that criteria. Uh, although, in fact, actually, the one we're at today, uh, the big one, I think, actually does uh, fit that criteria. I mean, it's it's very difficult to imagine this mountain not being here or, or, or people not wanting to get, to go up it. So, um, you know, there definitely are these these kind of very unchanging uh, businesses and, and modes, but there's not many of them, and. Um, and of course, as, as we all know, um, the value creation in our society is not, um, you know, it's not really coming from these small, um, you know, uh, companies like this one. It's really from from some of the big tectonic changes happening in terms of the internet, uh, mobile telephony, and um, and uh, artificial intelligence. I think increasingly. So um, you know, I, I think um, you know, I keep an open mind about it. I'm, I'm happy to be invested in, in a bag bond, and I think it bring something to the, the portfolio, you know, as it's a company that kind of takes the risk off the table of something being disrupted. But I think it's impossible to to uh, to avoid um, some of these um, you know faster faster growing companies which are which are changing changing our society. Um, you know, it's tough it's tough to beat the market and um, you know share prices follow earnings over time. So if you know the market as a whole grows at GDP, um, but within that, there's companies growing at 10, 20 percent, and then those shrinking or growing at zero percent. You're making an already difficult task of beating the market even tougher by kind of taking out that uh, that, uh, that universe of companies that um, um, are growing uh, are growing faster than GDP. So I think it's something that uh, 
I've definitely decided for myself I need to, to pay a lot more attention to, and I think probably um, other people should too. Um, um, even if you decide not to invest in a Facebook or a Google, um, you, you better be making sure you understand what they do because they have plans for which affect the, the car industry, the insurance industry, uh, media in any case. So um, what you think to be your nice, safe, unchanging businesses are probably, uh, probably going to be impacted uh, uh, anyway. So if you're going to if you're going to look look to those type of businesses, um, you know then of course there's also as always trade offs to be made. So you could have some rapidly changing company growing at a breakneck pace, but where you know has to kind of reinvent itself every every two years, on the one hand, and then at the other end of the spectrum there's companies which I think the moat is very established and um, unlikely to be to be to be breached, and you know the two tech companies uh, we have in the portfolio are uh, Alphabet, which we've had a long time, um, and Facebook. And, you know, I think the moat for both of those companies is is enormous. Uh, I think it's growing, and I, I think it's incredibly unlikely that it's not going to be there in five years, or they have to do something unexpected within three years or, you know, five years to, to still, still have a moat. So within this sort of opportunity set of what you might call tech companies, I've tried to allocate our capital um, to the ones which I think are uh, the most likely to have a, a sustainable moat and, and ones which are certainly uh, growing the moat. And that's maybe one of the trade-offs I made when I paid what many of you may think is a slightly high multiple for, for, for Facebook. So it's, it's, it always comes down, down to trade-offs. But, um, uh, you know, I think, um, I think it's going to be, I think it's a, a mistake not to pay a lot of attention to innovation. And then on the law of large numbers being a headwind to really unusual compounding. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, clearly you can't have really unusual compounding if, if a company is, is already the largest company in the world. Um, you know. um, but um, that aside, um, you know, we've been invested in Google now for uh, you know, five, five years, I think. And it was already a big, big company when, when we were invested. And, you know, if, I, if I'm honest, at the time, it was growing at about 20% a year, and I would have assumed it was on some kind of a, a glide path down to, to more normal kind of revenue growth rates. And, uh, you know, it, it, that hasn't materialized. I mean, it's the, the growth has been fairly st steady at 20%, and if anything, is, is accelerating. It dipped a bit below 20% a couple of years ago, and they announced their, uh, their full-year results uh, uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, if anything, the revenue revenue growth is accelerating, especially on a, on a on a constant currency basis. So, you know, I think it's a mistake to think that the large companies can't compound at a at a, at a very good clip. And uh, you know, especially you know, if I compare that to the the small cap opportunities in Germany, for example. So, when I first started investing, my universe was mainly these sort of small cap German companies. I, you know, I loved them then. I, I still kind of love them now. But um, even though they're kind of small companies, um, um, so you would think they have very long runways ahead of them, the reality is they're also addressing, for the most part, quite small markets, um, quite mature markets. And um, I can scarcely think of, um, you know, of, of my, the universe of companies I know, and I, I know most of them, I can scarcely think of any of them which are growing sustainably above 15% a year. Um, the one, one exception is Grinker. Uh, Grinker Leasing, which we've been invested in since, since the very start of the fund, uh, which is growing you know, 15, 20 percent a year. That's, that's fantastic, but that's, that's actually a pretty short list. So, if um, if people say you know the value creation opportunity is is um, is bigger than in small caps than large caps, I'm, I'm not sure. I would agree I agree with that. I think there's opportunities in, in both spaces. And in, in terms of the size of the opportunity um, uh, that you know, a company like Google or, or Facebook has. There as well, I think, um, um, you know, people people have really underestimated how, how expansion, how you know, how these companies are expanding their markets. You know, so you know, one approach to you know YouTube is to say, okay, how big is the you know the TV market, you know, or TV advertising market rather, and, you know, what kind of share might they be able to to get of that, and you know, then do derive some kind of valuation from that. You know, but that would just be a huge mistake. You know. There's, there's, you know, grandmothers in New Zealand advertising their knitwear, in, uh, and selling it to, um, you know, young mothers in Germany. Um, this isn't displacing. <laughs> this isn't displacing TV advertising. This is, 
this is really uh, increasing the uh, increasing the pie pie for everyone. And I think there was a similar debate about Uber a few years ago. Someone said, "Listen, even if you assume they take the whole taxi market <laughs> worldwide, uh, you know, you still don't get to to where the valuation is." But you know, as we as as uh, as we now know, when when Uber comes along, people start taking multiples more more journeys for all kinds of different use cases than, than they did previously. So, um, you know, uh, Google. Uh, often talks about just sort of scratching the surface of, of you know, the opportunities in search and um, the opportunities for, for doing a better job and connecting more companies to, to users. And they've been saying it long enough and demonstrating it long enough. I, I believe them. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Joan, uh, Joan Steve. Uh, I'm passionate about uh, researching uh, successful business model companies. I co-manage uh, a fund in Spain. And uh, I would like to exchange with all of you uh, about uh, business models, investment ideas, industry outlook. This is why I'm wearing this tag, so you can approach me directly uh, without being shy. Uh, the two quick questions I have is, <clears throat> I've been talking about Novo, it's a very good question. Do you think that what they do do on that insulin can become a kind of commodity in the medium or long term? And the second question is you have been writing about India and China and emerging market the options. And what is your view and what are you doing in those two respects? Sorry, yeah. Two, 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 two interesting questions. Thank you. <coughs> um, you know, so um, this this comes back to what we're talking a little bit about with with innovation. You know, clearly any company, no matter how great it is, if it keeps banging out the same old boring product, um, you know, um, that's not going to be a great business. Um, uh, it's going to be a business that uh, at some point gets competition and uh, you know, and which which deteriorates. Um, and uh, if if it's the case that um, you know, Novo doesn't produce new insulins which are better and, and differentiated. Um, you know, clearly it's it's not going to be uh, a particularly good investment. Um, but what makes Novo, um, you know, one of the things that kind of appealed to me about it as an investment is, um, you know, they insulin is a so-called large molecule, which is much more difficult to produce than, than smaller molecules, and. Um, um, you know, when you get generic competition in, in large molecules, it's called biosimilar, and um, whereas in, in smaller molecules, it's effectively generics. And generics are identical, <laughs> biosimilars are, as the name suggests, similar but but not identical. And what that means is, um, if the business, you know, so in, in in small molecule business, as soon as there's generic competition, you can bet your life on it from you know day one to day two. That business more or less disappears completely overnight. Um, you know, someone comes in producing the medicine at cost. Everybody switches to it, and you know, your business is, is basically gone. It's, you know, what we think of as, as the patent cliff. Um, you know, and um, you know one of the attractive things about Novo is that um, although it won't be a great business if, if it doesn't innovate, um, it's um, uh, it's not comparable to the small molecule business. So it has a lot more time. It's it's much more difficult for customers uh, to switch um, uh, insulins. Uh, it involves kind of going to, to the doctor, getting a new prescription, sl slowly titrating the, uh, the new insulin to the blood, potentially because you're not used to the new insulin, having uh, difficulties with it, which can involve hypos and hospitalization, which creates cost for the system, and annoyance for the insured person. And so it's a much stickier business and a much more kind of forgiving business of uh, a failure to innovate than, than, for example, a small molecule um, business. Um, um, so that's why it's a much li less risky business than, than other pharmaceutical companies, and, and that's part of the reason uh, why I invested in it. Um, but let, let me be completely clear. I mean, for it to be a good investment I and mean, a good business, it needs to innovate in insulin. It needs to make better, uh, better insulins. And, um, I strongly believe that that's, that's the case, and, and that will continue to be to be a great business. But that's really the sole thing I'm looking at. Not one thing; it's the sole thing. Right? So, if there was a room full of pharma analysts today, and um, 
uh, the CEO of Novo was kind enough to join our, our little meeting here. You know, every single question he would get would be, "What's happening with pricing in the U.S.? What's uh, you know, what's happening with Lantus? What's Lily going to do? What do you think?" You know, it would all be this kind of very detailed micro questions on different scenarios around pricing and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not really too worried about that. I think that's kind of missing the wood, wood for the trees. What will determine the investment case is the degree to which its insulins and GLP-1s and other products are better. Because nobody wants an inferior medicine for himself and no one wants an inferior medicine for, for their family. And to the extent they can, can keep producing better medicines, so it will continue to be, to be a great business. And that's what I'm following. So the second question was all there. Second question was about uh, your view on, uh, on your standpoint now with China, India, and yeah, uh, you know what I look for is companies I can hold for the long term and um, and um, and then enjoy kind of compounding and you know get, you know getting rich with the business by the by the by the business becoming uh, more valuable as opposed to being uh, some sort of super smart guy that buys it when it's cheap and sells it on and moves on to the next company. So in that respect, China and India are kind of right bang in the middle of my sweet spot. Um, you know, they're young economies with lots of growth opportunity as people become wealthier and enter the, the formal economy and from the formal economy to the, the middle classes and stuff. So I love uh, both countries and I, I visited both countries last year and uh, for sure we'll visit at least one of them uh, this year as well. Um, but they're very different markets. Uh, people tend to, to kind of bundle them into two. I, I can't think of two countries more, more different than India and, and China. It's, uh, it's amazing. The one is uh, one is kind of chaotic and democratic and uh, uh, energetic and uh, you know, houses and makeshift houses all over the place. You know, the one is a kind of, the other is a sort of a, you know, nominally at least a communist, it's a dictatorship, uh, or rather there's no, there's no democracy there and everybody lives in these very organized high-rise buildings with, um, uh, with great infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. So, Two very different markets, uh, but two both two very appealing markets. Uh, what I love about India is, um, um, you know, the breadth of businesses. Um, Indians have very a very close affinity to, to kind of Anglo-Saxon culture. That a lot of the, the CEOs I meet are, are fans of Berkshire Hathaway and really viscerally kind of get the type of things that are important uh, to us. And then China is a kind of a, a different situation. I think most of the market for me is not really investable. Um, it's quite difficult to list your company on the, the stock exchange there. The ones that do get on tend to be these sort of former government-owned uh, businesses, which isn't really what I'm, uh, I'm looking for. I like sort of owner-run businesses with you know, passion and culture and not kind of civil servants. Um, but the one area which I really love in China is, uh, is the internet space. It's, uh, it's uh, it's fantastic in terms of the rate it's growing. You know the passion of the people. Um, you know I think there's a lot of honest and well-intentioned uh, entrepreneurs there because you know the opportunity to get rich by growing the business is just so enormous. It would be insanity to kind of risk that by you know kind of stealing money from the company or, or doing any kind of dodgy stuff. So um, you know I think that's uh, that's that's been a sweet spot for, for a business owner and will continue to be. Um, so that's kind of how I think about the opportunity set in, in those two countries. And they both offer very different but, but very attractive opportunities. Like, like I mentioned in my letter as well, um, uh, I think, um, you know, even if you're a little bit skeptical about China and think, um, you know, perhaps correctly, uh, you don't speak the language, you don't really want to invest there, um, I would still take a close look at it because uh, they're kind of building the future faster than we are in the West. So if you want to kind of know the, the, the route some of our kind of internet services are going to take, I think you can do a lot worse than look at what's happening in China. That's Hi Rob, hi everybody. Um, Rob, first of all, I want to thank you for hosting this event because I think it's a great opportunity. You do a great job. You do building up the industry in a way that yeah, money is managed better than in most parts of maybe the industry, um, which I left uh, because I didn't find uh, someone who lived <coughs> uh, your way in not being a one-man ship 
which makes me think maybe a one-man ship is the best <laughs> opportunity in managing the money like you do it. Um, since I do the translation of your letters, uh, which gives me a great exercise of really thinking about what you mean, what's the point you want to say, I came across, uh, across two questions. One is a company-specific one concerning Facebook, and one is a more general one in your style of uh, managing the founder. The one on Facebook is, um, you write that Facebook is a purpose-driven company, and since you uh, well, have a lot, uh, stress a lot on uh, uh, how the management is, so what's your take on uh, Mark Zuckerberg's way uh, of um, thinking about shareholder value? You write that uh, he maybe puts the purpose of the company uh, before the well, uh, financial development, which I think is, is good in the long term, but if there is no understanding of shareholder value creation, this could be a point where, well, Facebook is doing great, but from an investment standpoint, it's, uh, it's not getting to the, uh, to the targets you want to have the company as an investor. The second question is, um, you, you're doing your letters. I'm interested in if you're doing other write-ups or notes in uh, having the chance to come back in some years uh, to the point in saying, okay, what, what was my take on the company there? Because as we all know, with events in, uh, in the companies, uh, maybe you change your mind and um, yeah, uh, doing a write-up is, is a good thing, but it's a scarce resource and one uh, captain ship uh, is time. So is it a waste of time doing notes for you or how do you uh, do this in managing a business owner? Okay, um, so it was more kind of whether I do notes for myself or whether I should do notes for, for yourself. Okay, yeah. um, you know, well, I've I've had a I think I've derived enormous benefit from from the letters uh, and and lots of dis, uh, lots of respects and this slightly touches on one of the things I'm I'm going to say tomorrow um, uh, for the emerging managers. But when I kind of started out, um, the kind of the consensus was invest um, um, managers should should never communicate to their investors what they're invested in. Um, and uh, you know the rationale being these 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 ideas are so unique and, and valuable that um, uh, they're kind of the intellectual property of the manager and you shouldn't share them with with, with his investors. And um, you know I kind of decided I, I would go uh, a different route of being as transparent um, as possible about kind of um, how I invest from a kind of philosophical perspective, and then. So people can then judge for themselves, hey, is this guy actually doing what he says? Then being also transparent about what I'm investing in and why I'm investing in there. So it's kind of a, a closed loop where people can kind of, you know, kind of check what I'm doing all the way through from performance to investment philosophy to the actual investments. Um, and, um, you know, I think I've derived nothing but, <laughs> but benefit from doing doing it that way. Um, you know, it's, a, you know, probably... Um, <coughs> you know, most of the world's population doesn't read my, my letters. Uh, fortunately, a few people do, and the ones that kind of make it to the end are the ones who, who kind of, I guess, feel a resonance with them and, and the way I think, and they're the ones that kind of reach out to me and then and become a partner of the fund, and so it kind of self-selects for the, the right partners. Um, it helps me to kind of clarify my, my thinking. Oftentimes in life, all kinds of things, you can think you understand something or think you know something, but it's actually when you only write it down, you realize you, that, that uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, you don't. So so writing it down has helped me to clarify things. I also think it kind of creates a, a kind of a check on, on my work. So, um, you know, pe people love nothing more than to kind of point out if, if you've got something wrong. Um, and, and I kind of embrace that. So if I spend two pages writing about why I think a CEO is a great CEO, then, um, uh, uh, and you know he screwed someone over at some point in his career, or treated his employees badly. You know, I'm I'm pretty sure people would kind of reach out to me very quickly and say, you know, what on earth are you talking about? That's that that's wrong. And, um, uh, and so it kind of creates, um, um, you know, it kind of creates a check on my work, which is important <coughs> as, I, as I work on my own. Um, it's it, it, you know it's also read by by other investment investment managers, so it kind of draws people into my circle who think alike and who I enjoy interacting with. And, Helps me as a one-man show to to nevertheless uh, have a network of people I can connect with. So, 
you know, there's really, really um, no no disadvantage I've kind of felt from from that. And uh, you know, um, uh, uh, I would definitely not not do it any differently. I don't think. Klaus, maybe you can remind me of your first. Yeah, so this is a super important point. Um, um, so I guess, you know, in the, you know, probably about 10, 20 years ago, the, the buzzword was shareholder value. So there was this idea that if companies put front and center generating the most possible value for their shareholders, which meant kind of, you know, achieving the best possible earnings as possible, so raising prices or lowering costs and all that kind of stuff, then, um, that would be the best possible outcome for, for shareholders and, and you know shareholders were kind of encouraged to focus on companies who were creating shareholder value and you know the ones that weren't were kind of uh, criticized and you know given a discount of stuff and I think this idea has just been completely discredited um, you know the, the, the way companies create value is by creating value for their customers um, and so if you create value for your customers, then you know, kind of the, sh the shareholder value is just a kind of a happy, happy side effect uh, of that. And so, um, I, I can't emphasize how, how important that, that that point is enough. Um, um, you know, so what I look for is a company which is kind of customer focused and, and purpose driven, and that kind of gives them the, the kind of the guideposts of of where they're trying to get to. And, um, and it's an absolute prerequisite for success. It's not a guarantee of success, but it's a prerequisite to kind of know where you're trying to get to. And um, if you do know where, where you're trying to get to, then you still, of course, have to get there, but it uh, puts you in a, a big advantage. And, um, you know, I can't, uh, maybe I should have made that a bit clearer in my letter, but, you know, it's not that I don't care about Facebook uh, making money. I just think if it sort of stays true to its purpose and focuses on, on, on the mission, which is kind of connecting people Will create huge value for for its uh, its customers. Uh, it will make the type of investments it needs to to to, to guarantee a good long term experience. It will energize the employees because of course employees are motivated by by mission and, and autonomy. Uh, they're not motivated by money. Money is a kind of a, a side effect. And um, you know, so if they get all those things right, then as an investment, it will, it will do very well for us. Hi everyone, um, this, my name is Saurav, this is my first time here and first time in Switzerland, so really delighted to be with all of you. Uh, I Just a quick observation, you know, this uh, coming here, uh, driving here early this morning, uh, getting up this mountain with a group where a lot of people like me are not even carrying snow gear, uh, you know, reminded me of, you know, this, I, I grew up in North India around this time of the year, there's a festival, and kids wake up early in the morning to fly kites, and there's a lot of excitement. But you know, for a meeting, uh, you know, to have that kind of a passion and excitement and be involved in questions, I'm so delighted to be part of a group like this. Uh, and Rob, uh, this is, you know, a testament to, you know, your integrity and uh, the letters that you write. I had a question regarding the remark that you made on Baidu. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Howard Marks once, you know, talking said that what should happen is not necessarily what will happen. And what I found remarkable in how you were writing is that I thought this would happen to the stock. This did happen to the stock. But I want to tell all of my partners that this is not how I thought it would happen. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting. You decouple the process and the outcome. But in doing that, is there a chance that maybe you were also being a little bit too hard on yourself in the sense that, you know, if you have an FTA-like regulatory body, which is deciding who's going to advertise related to healthcare and so on, and sort of weeding out a lot of the bad players out. Whereas here, in the absence of something as strong <coughs> as that, uh, are, we, are we rightfully putting all of the blame on Baidu, or maybe we can give them some benefit of the doubt? Thanks. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, um, you know, so I'm, I, I don't speak Chinese and I'm, I'm a long way from China, so I kind of have to think about Baidu in maybe slightly bigger, bigger kind of picture terms than, um, than maybe, you know, companies which I'm, I'm a little bit uh, closer to. Um, but, you know, I think um, I've learned an enormous amount by studying Baidu and, and the Chinese ecosystem and, of course, comparing those learnings to 
uh, you know, to Google and, and the kind of job uh, that it's uh, that it's done. And, and you know, I think it's super important to to realize that you know maybe in the very earliest years of um, of the internet, um, there was a kind of a, a lock in to a, to a to a good search engine. You know, we the internet was new to people; they didn't know kind of where stuff was, um, and um, uh, and so they kind of required a search engine and to get there, and and, um, uh, and that was obviously great for, for Google uh, and also for Heidi. Um, you know, but today that the situation is is really completely completely different. So for for the for the commercially valuable searches, um, you know, so like a travel arrangement or um, uh, you know, or me, you know, medical thing or uh, e-commerce or whatever, you know, there are wonderful vertical but they're effectively search engines, if you think of Amazon or um, uh, Booking.com or whatever, which will do a very fine job for you of, um, of um, find, you know, finding what it is you're, you're looking for. Uh, you know, they won't tell you, you know, how high is the Mount Titlis, but um, uh, that's not really a very, uh, uh, maybe there's some commercial value to that search because you might be looking to, to book a holiday, but it's, it's not nearly as valuable as uh, can I book a hotel. Um, so um, you know, so why why is Google, you know so does that mean search engines have kind of had their day and, and, and Alphabet is no longer um, uh, a valuable company? Or, you know, does Baidu kind of give us a, a sense of what might be around the corner for, for Alphabet? Um, you know, possibly, but I think what it what it definitely tells us is you better be doing an amazing job on search because no one is obliged to come to your uh, to your search engine and. Um, you know, using Google for me and I think for pretty much everyone is kind of a delight. You kind of get amazed by um, uh, by the results that that that, that they uh, that they give and the different ways of in inputting it. And when you start typing and it already has the result for you, it's kind of it's fun to use and it kind of encourages you to um, to kind of search for all kinds of crazy stuff where five years ago probably you wouldn't have bothered because it would just take you know it'd be too unlikely you'd get a a good result. And um, I think that's, um, you know, the reason makes Alphabet such an amazing business. And, you know, they, they announced their results a couple of days ago. And the search inquiries were up like 40% or something. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. This is a mature business. Uh, one of the largest companies around has been at Sims forever. And they did almost half as many searches this last year as, as the year before, as half as many again. And, and that just tells you how how much people love this, uh, this uh, you know, search engine, and, and how how you know, strong their expectation is, it's going to find find them you know, the kind of answers they're looking for. So that's kind of really what what Google's moat is uh, today. And I've got a horrible feeling, and I don't speak Chinese, and um, I'm not as close to it as, as, as perhaps I, uh, you know, a local person might be. But I've got a horrible feeling that Baidu's blown. Um, you know, you send you send people, you know, a medical inquiry. You send people to uh, some commercial provider who shouldn't be there. I mean, that's. I mean, how much? I mean, you're going to make a, a quick buck in the short term, but how how much kind of goodwill are you going to destroy if that person has has a bad experience uh, uh, in, in in the longer run? And um, you know, I, I travel in China uh, quite a bit, and you know, when 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 you're in China, the, the type of feedback you get is. You know the, the 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 thing people have a lot of enthusiasm for is is WeChat and, and Weixin and, and maybe um, you know Taobao and Alibaba. Uh, you know, that, those those are the kind of businesses which are delighting people and and um, um, uh, which kind of generate the type of enthusiasm I was talking about for, for for Alphabet. And you know my kind of fear and you know hopefully it doesn't doesn't happen. But my my fear is that kind of Baidu is just going to become more and more marginalized as the kind of this universe of things that you can only find through a generalist search engine gets kind of uh, smaller, smaller and smaller. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it. Um, and, and maybe one other point as well, which is a big difference between Alphabet and Baidu is, um, you know, the, the, the commercially, the commercial, commercially relevant advertisers in Baidu, and, uh, sorry, in China are much more concentrated than here. So, you know, for example, for, for booking travel, there's basically sea trip. And that's it. So there's not really much point in going to a search engine if you know you're always going to end up a C trip anyway. And um, you know, I think that's what makes the situation Google's in uh, a much much better one because there's obviously this you know TripAdvisor and Booking.com and Expedia and, and 
various other ones and this amazing search experience you get from Google. So there's much more of an incentive to maybe start the search at, um, at a generalist search engine and, and kind of see where it ends up. Well, can I just say something about Python? Yeah, sure. Shall I shall I give you the microphone? Sorry. No, no. Okay. Just, I just want to say a word about this. The Python and the Google example. Um, the thing is that all the referrals now happens in WeChat, and WeChat, as if you don't know, it's PayPal, it's Facebook, it's Uber, it's Booking.com, it's WhatsApp, of course. Um, and and we have uh, we stay for one dating, and nobody goes anywhere now except in WeChat. If they need a doctor, they go to WeChat. If they need to book something, they go to WeChat. If they want to look for a company, they go to WeChat because WeChat has a uh, business Facebook platform that's integrated. So so it's, it's, a, it's a totally <coughs> different approach. And also because of the uncertainty or reliability of what you see elsewhere. Not only on Baidu, but basically everywhere else. Uh, WeChat is because it's a community and it's cross referral system, so people use that. So that's one thing. And the other thing is about innovation, and this is, uh, and Rob is correct. I, I went to a conference, and actually, the three biggest tech leaders uh, Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, and Beijing. So, um, this integration, innovation, and WeChat, and what it does, and how it makes uh, Baidu irrelevant. Is, is actually the kind of things that you're seeing in, in the Chinese market. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, call, thank you so much for that comment, and you really hit the nail on the head. And I, I'd love to be able to tell you that I heard that type of comment for the first time today, but I've actually been hearing it for the last five years. <laughs> Rob, Rob, just one more thing to that list, and to play games. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've been hearing that for five years, and I was kind of too boneheaded to, to, to listen. And uh, I felt much more comfortable about a search engine in China uh, because of, you know, I obviously know Alphabet very well, well here, but uh, uh, WeChat was definitely um, uh, a much better better opportunity and probably still is today. And uh, I think that's, uh, fortunately, Baidu worked out quite well, but it could have, could have been better. And, uh, that's good. I want to get better. Hi. Uh, I'm Tim from Hamburg. I uh, co-manage a company which invests in uh, renewable energy, so I try to save the planet and make some money of it. And I know Rob for quite a while now and uh, follow his approach and admire him very much. And thank you very much for hosting this event thank today you. and tomorrow. Uh, I got two questions for you. Um, one on innovation, the other one on granted. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned earlier that innovation is key to make it a good, a really great business. Um, so how do you make sure when you invest, that uh, the company really has the ingredients for for innovation. Uh, how do you how do you how do you make sure this uh, beforehand? I mean, if you look at Apple in the past, they have been very innovative. They're not been innovative anymore. They're innovative again now, not so much innovation anymore. So, how do you, for example, if you take Novo, uh, what makes it feel secure that they're very innovative and not Sanofi is coming up with the I don't know with, with the cure or something? Um, so that was the first question, and taking this on Ranker, um, as you pointed out earlier, they're the ones which are growing pretty much 15% every year if they go into new markets each year. Uh, so how do you see this in the future, um, coming back to innovation as actually their, their, their real business has not been so much innovation? And uh, secondly, how do you see the dependency on the, on the founder of Wolfgang Ranker as he's getting older and older, not getting younger, unfortunately. So, so how do you view this and see this as a risk for the yeah. company? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you for, for both questions. So, uh, you know, I think um, uh, find, identifying innovation is going to be very, or is very tough. And, uh, and the biggest problem is, of course, there's going to be a lot of false positives. So, you know, if you look at any company that's successful, you know, you tend to think, oh, wow, what a great management it must have and how innovative it must be and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's just a, a mental bias that we have that um, when, when someone's doing one thing well, you kind of assume they're doing everything else uh, uh, well as well. And, and that need, need not necessarily be the case. And you only kind of realize when a company isn't being innovating, when it's sort of all of a sudden someone comes along and, uh, and then it's kind of too late. So I think it, it is going to be 
uh, super difficult. Um, but that's good because you know um, we have competition from other thoughtful fund managers, and increasingly we're going to have competition from machines. <laughs> so we need we need there to be difficult questions which can be solved through through insight. And uh, you know I think um, the the way to approach it is. Um, uh, you know, first of all, to be to be kind of conscious of how difficult it is, how, how rare it's going to be able to, to really to, to identify the, the positive positives. Um, so that's a kind of an important first step. And then, um, you know, I think the next step is really, um, you know, what it's likely to be an innovative, uh, you know, culture. And uh, you know, I think it's, you know, when when the you know the founder is the one who really sets the example um, uh, by giving the freedom. For people to innovate, permission to fail, because you know innovation is mainly about, about failure. So I think that's um, that's also really uh, really important. And um, and I think you you know I think um, you need to find sort of kind of it's a bit like a treasure hunt where you need to kind of find clues where where it's kind of being given away. You know, so I, and I, I think I put a link on the talk that Astro Teller gave on on innovation and. Um, you know, so you kind of ask a group of people, do you think innovation is important? Of course, everyone says, yes, of course, it's innovation. And, you know, um, and uh, you know, so if you had an opportunity which had a high but uncertain payoff, would you, um, you know, would you do it? And everyone says, yes, of course, of course we would do it. And then it's like, would your boss let you do it? <laughs> I was like, uh, uh oh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you need to find places where the bosses are letting people, uh, letting people do it. And, uh, you know, I think we have some some great examples in, in the portfolio where that's the case. Uh, uh, definitely, definitely Alphabet. Um, you know, people often talk about the risk of overspend in um, in in the um, in the other bets, and you know, probably is the case. But the risk for a company that which is that big and that do dominant is kind of underspent. So you want to be kind of rather overshooting than um, and undershooting. So then, um, kind of. Grenka, I guess as well. There was, the, you know, the question: Is it like concretely are they innovating, or how do we know if we're they're innovating? So was that the kind of the gist? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah and, and the founder leader. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so um, you know, I think Grenka has done a great job on um, on really sort of de developing the business over the last ten years. Um, you know, it's sort of entered into new product categories. Um, into new markets, um, so it hasn't kind of just sat back on, on what it was was doing. It's um, you know it's invested in in, in factoring and in the financial crisis. It bought a bank in order to to get a banking license and be able to take deposits. And so I think it's it's done a lot uh, in that respect. Um, I think there is some change kind of coming along to the finance business in general. In that um, you know. Uh, Artificial intelligence is going to change the way loans are underwritten. Um, uh, there's going to be much more powerful tools to, to kind of figure out which are the bad loans and which are which are the good ones. And um, it's going to be super important that they um, that they they make proper use of that. Um, but I think um, they, they've got a great chance because you know the 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 AI tools per se are going to be you know readily available. So if you if you go to Google's cloud. You know, kind of the various AI tools um, are going to be sort of part of the or already are part of the part of the package. Um, you know, the real bottleneck is the data because the AI needs to just crunch data in order to, to, to get results. And you know, Grinka has the data. It has. It's a very maths-based company. Mr. Grinka is a mathematician. He sponsors the chess world and lots of chess tournaments as a way to kind of find mathematicians and. Um, you know, so they kind of have the they have the, the raw talent, they have the data. So I think um, you know I think it's all nicely set up for them, but they have to innovate and they have to change probably the way they do things. And uh, it will be important to follow uh, follow the, how that works out and to make sure they're they're doing it. And then um, in terms of Mr. Grinka, so you know he's um, he's probably going to retire in the next year or so, which I think is a is a real shame. Um, uh, as he's been a, a wonderful steward for for the business, and um, but you know the good news is that you know, he'll remain the largest shareholder of the company. Yeah, he'll go onto the the supervisory board as a kind of a, a very active board member. I think he plans to come to the company one one day a, a um, one day a week. So you know I think um, 
what you need from that type of figure is not kind of someone into the day-to-day -day business and making operational decisions. You kind of need someone who kind of is a protector of the culture and uh, I'm optimistic that will continue to be the case. But if it's not, we can change our minds. <laughs> I always, I always think it's important to, to point out that I'm going to change my mind because, you know, one of the risks of sitting in a room like this and making statements and putting them into letters and writing it down is it can perhaps create a kind of commitment bias of, you know, I said that, so uh, I better better stick to it even if I change my mind. And, you know, I don't want that type of commitment bias. I like the commitment bias that comes from promising my investors to do things a certain way and then being compelled to do that. Uh, I think that's a, a great example of a positive commitment bias. And I, I don't want to feel wedded to, to something I've, I've said in the past in terms of a company's uh, moat or its the ability of its management. And I find, if, if I find different data which disproves my, my thesis, I'll, I'll simply change my mind. So second question, Jonathan. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a more general question, although it is going to be about Novo Nordisk and Facebook uh, okay. comparison. So what I'm wondering is, just on the management versus culture. So if you look at Novo Nordisk, you have a management. It seems like a more culture-driven company. You don't have insider ownership. Like there's no owner-operator in some sense, right? The ownership is close to zero percent, right? Um, and then you look at Facebook, which is which looks like more like owner-operator. But personally speaking, I find the culture a bit lacking in the sense that when I when I was looking for a job. There was Facebook and Google, and, and these are like one of the major options, and Amazon. And um, I did not even apply to Facebook because I, and the reasons for this is that, okay, for example, I have deactivated my account from Facebook, and the reasons are the way they kind of um, sell the ads. So if you, if you book a hotel, this hotel is going to be on your Facebook ad on the side, like exactly this hotel. And this is kind of, I find it very, very, and the problem is they have all the data that, like all the information who you are married to, who your kids are, what the photos are, and it's like, and then they use it to completely kind of um, target the ads for you, and that's, Google does it in some respect, but it's not that detailed in some sense, the targeting is not that. Uh, if you if you have followed the discussion of free basics in India, for example, for Facebook, that was also very worrying to me, um, the way they tried to kind of offer internet uh, to people. So. There are worrying things there, in my opinion. Maybe you, you disagree with that. But kind of, if you take a more generalized view, I'm sort of talking about uh, owner operator, which is Mark Zuckerberg, and the culture is, let's say, a little bit lacking there. There are worrying aspects. And then you have uh, management, which is not actually owner operator, but they are like, they have a culture and process which you can kind of look over a certain number of years and say, okay, they have fantastic capital allocators. So, how do you think about um, that? difference in some sense. Okay, yeah. so a couple of questions in there. I think the kind of the criticism of Facebook was a little bit around sort of the question of privacy and if I book a hotel here, I don't want it showing up on my feed and all this kind of stuff. Um, also that you have to like re, they change their privacy settings all the time and you have to again say, you know, yeah. click on this, go to these settings, activate and re unclick the boxes basically and this has happened to me three or four times. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I, I probably have a slightly contrarian view on this, as, as, as you might expect as a, as a shareholder. But, um, you know, I think uh, that there's two kind of important things to say about privacy. So the one is kind of everyone kind of feels strongly about it. And so if you ask someone about privacy and should there be more of it, everyone would sort of like, you know, 99% would probably put up their hand and, and say, say that's the case. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, there are a lot of opportunity to kind of Put your, set up your settings on, on Facebook and, and other services as well, and you know, 99% of people don't actually do it. <laughs> so, so there's a kind of a disconnect between what people say and, and what they do. But if, if it is important to you, you can you can uh, adjust it. And if you don't have if, you know, people are on Facebook an hour a day, and if they don't have time, <clears throat> five minutes to kind of change their settings, then I would question really how how important it is. So, um, so that's that's the first thing. Uh, and the second, um, actually, by far the more important point, I think, is, um, you know, kind of um, privacy is a kind of a two a two edged sword with kind of different trade offs and positives and negatives. And um, you know, Charlie Munger said at last year's uh, shareholder meeting, you know, 
anyone who states, um, you know, a disadvantage of something it should have a, an obligation to also state the other side of the argument. And maybe maybe that's what I'll, I'll do now on, on, on the subject of privacy. So, um, you know, huge amount of value is created by people, you know, allowing Facebook access to their data. Um, you know, it allows them to connect to the friends they want to, uh, they want to find. It allows them to get content which uh, is going to be interesting to them. So if I was on Facebook completely anonymously, they wouldn't have a clue whether to send me, uh, you know, uh, content on you know, uh, financial stuff or fashion or, or, or who, who knows what. So um, you know, kind of a lot of a lot of value is created through this kind of sacrifice we make by giving up some of our, our, our privacy. And equally important from a societal perspective, a huge amount of value is created by giving companies the ability to connect to people who are interested in their, um, in their, in their products. So, you know, I kind of always kind of laugh a little bit when you sort of, you know, you're watching news and in France and Francois Hollande was talking about how terrible this is or the, this unemployment and uh, all these young people that don't have a job and his kind of number one priority is job creation, number two is job creation, number three. And, and that's all very well. Uh, but then kind of there's a big debate about there should be more privacy and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And the reality is the only way a job gets created is by connecting a company to a customer. And um, that's what Google and, and also Facebook have just done uh, to an, an amazing extent, you know, like I mentioned earlier, allowing, um, you know, a kind of a, a grandmother in New Zealand to sell knitwear to a mother in Germany. These are <coughs> transactions that would just never happen without, uh, without these platforms. So I think people need to realize that um, although there's certain disadvantages for privacy and if they feel strongly enough about it, they have to take a little bit of time to, to change their settings. Um, but there's also huge advantages from it. And, and, and the advantages are just, just so much bigger than and the disadvantages. I think um, that's an important thing for people to think about. Yes, thank you, voices. Um, skin in the game. In the middle. Yeah, so uh, Nova was uh, a, a little bit of an unusual investment for me in that there isn't really a kind of a, a strong owner um, there. So, you know, my kind of best case scenario is an owner operator uh, as a major shareholder who can kind of provide that uh, protection from the short termism of, of the capital markets. And, you know, my second best case is is uh, is a strong rational owner who's not directly involved in the business, but kind of keeping an eye on things. And um, and um, you know, you don't really have uh, well with Nova Nordisk, you don't have a kind of an individual doing that. You do have one very large shareholder, which is the uh, the Novo Foundation, and I think they've done a have done a really um, a good job up until now. Um, uh, of kind of setting the company up in the right way and leaving the, the managers to, to, to do the job correctly and making sure there's a certain element of purpose to, to the company's mission and stuff. So, you know, I think up until now that's, that's done well. Um, it is, you know, the company is going through a tougher patch now and, and that type of foundation sometimes isn't the most functional type of organizational unit when that's the case. So I have to follow how, exactly how that, how that develops, but I, no, um, you know, I prefer the owner operator, the, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg to the Novo Foundation, but uh, I feel feel quite good about the Novo Foundation as well. Hi again, Rob. Um, Brian. Hi. Um, I have a question. I need to set a context to it before I ask the question. Yeah, Con sure. Context is macroeconomics, downside risk. Mm -hmm. So, again, in the context, we've got this unprecedented period in history exponential debt creation led by the Federal Reserve, um, quantitative easing, not actually going to but created debt into the money supply. A lot of it fed into the bond market, plus also the world indices, the equity markets, led to an inflation of stock values in the last decade in particular, uh, or eight years in particular. <clears throat> and this adds to a downside risk, in my view. We come to a point now where there's been a change of president and the nominally politically neutral Federal Reserve, which is, is anything but, um, clearly is opposed to the incumbent president now, are likely to go against him and have already started signaling they're going to raise rates. Mm -hmm. They may also not put in QE. This leads to the scenario whereby the 
the buffer which has been placed inherently into the stock market for the last eight years will dissipate. This buffer falls away. Pension funds redeem the uh, record rate due to baby boomers retiring. Downside risk. You're alongside only equity funds. Mm -hmm. Have you, this is the question now, have, have, you, <laughs> have, have you taken due consideration to this, this, these macro risks and the structure of the fund in the view of mitigating the risk with alternative measures which could be downside puts and possibly the recycling of residue knowledge that you already have. Um, case in point, um, Credit Acceptance Court is in a market which is clearly a, sort of a risky bubble market, subprime auto lending. It runs its business pretty well. I, I agree with that. But its competitors, less so. Do, have you considered placing counterbalance trades so that when the market itself drops in unison and the fund stops with it, that there is actually some reward due to the counterbalance? Um, the mechanisms I'll leave to you. It's yeah, not yeah. my field. Okay, so I think the kind of question is uh, potentially bad things can happen. You know, who knows how or what, but there's lots of different scenarios one, one could imagine. And, and you know, should, should things be done uh, differently as a, as a result of that? And, you know, um, the, the way I kind of manage the fund is um, ex without ever knowing when something bad is going to happen, expecting it to happen. Um, you know, so I, you know, if, you know, when 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 at some point we do have a very serious crisis and they, they do come along every every now and again, I, I, I won't have known when it will happen or, or what catalyzed it or what, what caused it, but I do expect it to happen. So I kind of not just because of the types of scenario you you raise there, suddenly doing something differently today. That's kind of always how how I do things, and um, so expecting. There to be a big kind of earthquake at some point, and before we know that could that could be tomorrow. Um, you know, how would you how would you set up your how would you allocate your capital? And um, you know, I think it would be um, you know. So there's no kind of like I was saying earlier. There's no zero risk free option. There's only a, a choice of alternatives. And I think cash would be an unbelievably stupid place to have your money, uh, or at least all of your money today, given um, given the types of risk you're talking about and um, uh, the fact that there's no re no return on it um, you know, bonds similar si sort of situation um, gold is often sort of talked about as a sort of being a kind of a great place to have your capital in a, in a crisis but um, the problem is you don't know when the crisis is um, you don't buy gold you know two days before the crisis it could be 10 years before the crisis uh, for all you know and, you know gold is just a, a really crappy investment uh, over time. Um, you know, uh, you know, you could buy. You know, a few years ago, if you you could have bought ten thousand Swiss francs worth of uh, the Skilift company where we're at today, and including the free pass you get, uh, as well as the dividend. You know, effectively for for eternity, you could have had um, a free weeks skiing uh, um, for um, you, know, you know a free weeks skiing uh, for 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 eternity, effectively because. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know the cost of skiing goes up, but then so does the price of the, the, the ski ski pass. So, uh, so does the earnings that the, the company makes, and so um, you know that, that would have been that, that that's that's the payoff. And just compare that to spending ten thousand um, francs on a bar of gold. You know, every year you want to go skiing, so every every year you have to kind of cut away a little bit of that that gold bar in order to to pay for the other five lift passes, and of course. At some point, none, none of that gold is is, is left. So, um, if you kind of knew when the crisis was going to be, then gold would possibly be an option. But if you're like me and think you don't know, I don't think it's a suitable way to, to place your money for the long run. So, it kind of only leaves companies uh, left as a place to to invest, and um, um, and companies have actually done very well in crises. Um, you know, so if you were in Cyprus a couple of years ago and had cash in the bank, you lost it all, and um, if you had cash in your wallet like I did in India, you kind of lost it all. And no matter what happens, though, companies, you know, they might lose a lot of their value if the economy goes down and stuff, but um, normally they survive, and normally um, you keep your ownership of them because it's kind of a really a central 
feature of our, our society that ownership rights have to be respected. If, if ownership rights aren't respected, then uh, kind of all bets are off, I think. Um, so, you know, I think companies is the best place to have your money in, in the long run. And then within the companies, there's certain features you want so that um, they at the very least survive in a crisis and, and ideally do better. And those features are, um, you know, for sure not having uh, any debt if they're uh, an industrial company and if they're a financial company, they should have far, far less debt than, than other people. They should ideally be, ideally be, be companies which don't lose too much uh, um, in a crisis. Um, or, if, or if they do, they should be a, a company which, uh, although it might lose, it's so much stronger than its competitors that it has the opportunity to to pick up, um, you know, pick up market share from some of the, the weaker players. So um, these are the type of things I think about. And I think the fund, uh, I think every single company in the fund has those type of features, uh, no debt or much more capital than, than their competitors, great cost positions, um, you know, the opportunity to hoover up market share if other players are, are, are weakening. So, you no, know, it's kind of interesting in the 2009 financial crisis, uh, regretfully, I wasn't invested in Alphabet at the time, but I was at a, the Eigenkapital Forum, which is a big conference of German stocks in, in Germany, where you can see kind of hundreds of companies over three days across obviously all types of sectors. And as you can imagine, the mood was very bad because the economy was really at, at rock bottom. And, um, the um you know so i have all these meetings with all these companies and they they would all basically say you know we're going to you know things are things are going really badly our, our business is down we have to save money we're going to cut newspaper advertising uh, we're going to cut tv advertising but we are allocating more to kind of search search advertising and uh, so i sort of kind of go out of the meeting uh, there's another business that's doing badly and you know numbskull that i was i didn't think to myself <laughs> Maybe, maybe I should be buying Google. <laughs> um, you know, so there are businesses that do really well in a crisis. And um, I think when the next crisis comes along, Facebook will do really well because, um, you know, Facebook's ads are massively mispriced at the moment. They're way too cheap. You know, when you speak to companies, they, they rave about how much cheaper it is to, to, to place an advertisement on Facebook uh, than it is on, uh, on Google. And that's not, that doesn't tell you that Google's a bad business. It tells you that. Facebook's price uh, ads are mispriced, and it's you know kind of difficult to advertise on social media. People kind of understand how search advertising works, but they, they don't understand social. So when something's difficult and the business is doing okay, they, they kind of put it off. But when the next crisis does hit and people suddenly need to generate customers to survive, um, they're going to be forced to, to to figure out how to advertise on Facebook, and that will be that will probably be a great great thing for the company. One part is going to cover um, consideration to counterbalance trades using your residual knowledge about competitors of the good companies that you know of. Have you considered that? You've, you've talked about in the response about lowest <coughs> equities. Again, you've reinforced your current policy, but have you considered a different approach for a paradigm change based upon unprecedented, unprecedented macroeconomic climate? Um, well, kind of the portfolio as it is today is kind of my, my kind of best best bet on, on how things are going to look and, and, and what the appropriate capital allocation for that is. But, you know, the great thing is, um, you know, managing, uh, managing capital is very easy and quick to change your mind. So if, um, if the situation changes and other companies seem to, to be better positioned to, to benefit from that, then um, for sure I'll, I'll change my mind. But um, uh, that's, uh, you know, as things stand at the moment, it's kind of my best bet. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Rob, um, I just, just, there's only 15 minutes to go, so not long now, and you can hit the slopes. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Paul Buser. I'm here from the state of Indiana in the United States. I help manage the uh, University of Notre Dame endowment. And um, this question's about RV capital. Um, this is an amazing day and, and weekend. You hit, you hit the 10 year mark. Um, you got 15 extra chairs in here because of your clout now. Uh, you, hired, you hired some young professionals to to uh, get the sound check going and hold the sign out front. Um, so you, you've really you've really made it now. I want to dovetail just on, on Nate's um, question on innovation and then your response on, on moats. Um, 
What, what is the most for RV? Um, and full disclosure, we're not investors, and we, we regret that, but um, we view you now as a Google or Facebook. And so if we're making that decision now, you, you've you made it. You're, you don't run these billions of dollars, but, but things are in place and you have a long history. Um, what, are, what are the threats to you, that, that to, to your moat, and how do you think about widening it, given that, that in most investment firms, the sinking of the moat is usually an internally driven thing? Uh, I just love, love your perspective. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, so um, this kind of will, will go a little bit into some of the things we're talking about tomorrow, uh, the way I've kind of set up and um, and, and why it's the case. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think I have quite a um, quite a decent competitive advantage, um, you know, for, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, first, it's maybe being a, a one-man show, you know, so um, it's kind of a, a very non-intuitive way for, for any type of business and maybe an investment business to be to be set up and, and um, uh, probably uh, a lot of people are kind of skeptical about it and that's why it's kind of difficult for other, other people to, to replicate. But if you think that um, if there was any type of economy to scale of investing, then even if it was minute, you know, a, a Fidelity or a BlackRock is so many thousands of times bigger than me that you know, it would be effectively impossible to compete. And, you know, so, so the fact that not, not just me, but other investors working on, on their own or very, in very small teams have beaten the market over a long period of time, I think, I think tells you that probably the small, smaller the team, uh, the better. And, and that's, uh, that's, it's tough for people to, to replicate because most, most people um, wouldn't give their capital to that, that type of structure. Um, you know, what I think is also super difficult is to have the permission um, and the capital from your investors to run a very concentrated portfolio. So, um, you know, I kind of had this dilemma when I set up RV Capital that I knew to at least have the chance of beating the market, you, you had to have a degree of concentration. It's, of course, absolutely no, no guarantee to beat the market, but if you've got 50 or 100 stocks in your portfolio, you're, you're definitely not going to beat the market. And the kind of dilemma is, is with, at least in Europe, um, the traditional fund structures insist on having um, a certain level of uh, diversification. And so if you're kind of interested in attracting capital and stuff, then you're most likely going to take one of those structures which can be publicly marketed. And I wanted to invest in a concentrated way, which meant I had to structure the fund as a, as a hedge fund. And then um, it was kind of a really weird thing because most people can't invest in a hedge fund. But to the extent they can, there's normally some kind of a long, short type market neutral wish in there. So I kind of had a structure which didn't really have a natural uh, buyer for it. And, you know, fortunately, over time, uh, I found investors and, um, and, um, and, and, and that's fantastic. But that's, that's also kind of a, a huge entry barrier. Um, and then the third area of competitive advantage, I think, is just the, the type of investors I have. So. Um, um, you know, when I started out, I thought, okay, I'm now, I'm now a fund manager, I better go out and find some, some investors. And um, so I would sort of go out and see if anyone would listen to what I have to say. And um, uh, unfortunately, a few people did, so they would take up a lot of my time, but then tell me they couldn't invest because I'd only been around for a year or <laughs> uh, the fund was only 10 million. And I was like, couldn't you have told me at the start of the meeting that you can't invest in someone who only has 10 million? You could have saved the last two hours. And, uh, no, so anyway, I, I gave up on sort of marketing and just sort of did my thing and sort of hoped that over time it would draw people's attention. And the great thing about doing it that way is that the people who kind of reach out to me are, are ones that have kind of self-selected to, to, to my type of model. So I, never, I would never get someone uh, reach out to me today who doesn't invest in a one-man show. You know, they, they simply wouldn't reach out in the first place if, um, if that was something they weren't looking for. So... No, I think as well that's uh, that's a source of competitive advantage. So um, I, I think it's um, um, you know I think there's 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 some some competitive advantage there, um, which gives me a, an opportunity to beat the market. But uh, whether we continue to beat the market will really depend on on me finding finding good ideas and analysing them properly. So that's what I need to concentrate on. <laughs> and how about widening the moat? <laughs> if those if those are just sustainable mode, how do you think about it growing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank thank you. Sorry, I so I missed that. So, you know, uh, is the moat growing? And you know, that's the kind of the, the wonderful thing is um, um you know, I have unbelievably loyal 
partners. You know, I don't think I've had a single meaningful redemption since since the fund started. And um, you know, and quite understandably, when someone invests with you to begin with, there's, they're presumably a little bit uh, enthusiastic about what what they do, but what what I'm doing, but probably also a little bit skeptical. Is it what it appears to be, and all that kind of stuff. And you know, with every year, passing year that someone's invested and sees I'm kind of doing things the way I say I'm, I'm doing them, they become more comfortable and uh, you know, more willing perhaps to give me permission to do unusual and counterintuitive uh, investments and um, more willing to kind of uh, accept that there's going to be uh, times of uh, poorer performance. And that's an amazing privilege because most funds don't have that um, don't have that uh, that opportunity. If you work for a big fund management company and have a few poor quarters, you know the salespeople start beating you up and telling people that you're not good enough anymore and you're someone else should be replacing you and all that kind of stuff. So it effectively makes people think in a lot more short term away and kind of feel lucky that uh, I don't have to uh, engage in that game. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for having us. My name is uh, Steph and I'm the partner of Samuel who, who asked the question before. Um, my question relates to um, Trupani and I had s s three questions regarding it. Uh, the first is regarding penetration. Mm -hmm. You said the pillar of, the, of your thesis is that the penetration has to increase or will or is likely to increase. And there I'd like to ask you on a more qualitative note, um, what makes you confident that this penetration will increase? Is it management? And I mean, if you refer to penetration in other countries, uh, such as Europe, but there are also big cultural differences. So health insurance for humans is not as widespread as it is in Europe. So there are cultural differences. So what makes you confident in what, with regards to penetration is the, per the first question. Um, the second question is related to um, customer value, you were saying. Mm -hmm. So what is the, the value uh, of companion to the customer? In the sense that couldn't they just pay mostly for for the bills on, on a running basis, because especially because um, preconditions are not covered, or um, or routine care, which are most maybe not the fat tails, but most of the of the cost that will come up for an, a pet owner. And the third question is, if you have this uncertainty in terms of outcome, how would you size? Panning compared to something where you have certainty, and what is your reasoning behind that? Thank you very much. Thank you. All, all really good questions. Um, might ask you just to kind of uh, repeat them as we as we go through them. So, I think was the first one was on uh, penetration. Pen penetration. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know with precision where penetration is going. So, you know, you can see in countries like the UK that it's sort of close to thirty percent. Um, you know, who knows where, where it ends up in the US and over what time period, but it, it seems to me a very safe bet that it's going to be a lot higher uh, than it is today. And, you know, it doesn't, you know, the invest, for the investment to, to, to work well, it doesn't require the market growing 30 times, you know, five times would probably be, be good, 10, 10 would be even better. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, I think, as I mentioned, there's, there's lots of reasons why the penetration is so low um, in, in the US. And, um, and in that sense, the kind of, I think the the fact that there is a, some competition as four or five other players actually probably helpful on balance. So, you know, there's now other medical insurance companies with kind of pro products of similar type of value. Trupani would probably argue this is better, but I think, you know, in the past there were very manipulative insurance policies which were sold basically as a fraud. So they had a very low price to get people in, but basically excluded everything. So understandably, most sensible people didn't didn't buy those. And, now the market's going much more towards, um, um, you know, sensible policies, and it's kind of good that there's not just true penny out there, you know, saying saying the word about um, why medical insurance makes sense. You know, it's it's good there's other guys there as well as that, that will help the market to, to grow bigger. And then you know, kind of whether whether insurance <coughs> makes sense, um, you know, cl clearly it does. Um, uh, if you know, in in a world where you know. There weren't that many treatment options available for pets, um, and maybe the most expensive one would be a couple of hundred dollars. Then clearly, you don't want to insure something which which is um, you know so such a small potential uh, loss amount. But you know today, I think um, um, Rodrigo, my 
let us a couple of years ago, I think one of the biggest tickets they pay out a month is $25,000. Um, apologize if that's the wrong number, but it's a, it's a huge number for, for, for most people. And, you know, um, a hip replacement, um, you know, can easily cost $5,000 and, and stuff. So these are, these are the type of risks which it makes sense to ensure if you care about your pet. And obviously not everyone, you know, some people will just say, okay, let's buy another pet. <laughs> that's fine, they're not gonna need insurance. But um, for a lot of people, they view the pet as a kind of a member of the family and, and would want their dog not to be put down just because it can't walk anymore or something like that. So for them, the, the, the insurance makes a lot of sense. In terms of sizing? Just yeah, um, yeah. so the the certainty I feel about True Panion is, is much lower than probably uh, <coughs> any other company in the portfolio. That's not to say it's low in an absolute sense. I wouldn't have invested in it otherwise, but you know, clearly it's at a much earlier stage. So the range of outcomes is bigger. There's kind of operational challenges they still need to, to kind of figure out. And, <coughs> and um, you know, I'm kind of, and, and there's also risks that only kind of, which we don't know about today, but only really kind of come, come up over a 20 year basis. You know, there's, you know, there's 20 year risks. Uh, by definition, a company has to have been around 20 years to know what those are, uh, or you know, possibly even longer. So for all those reasons, I think it's, it's riskier. Um, but, um, I found that the culture of the company and the opportunity and, and the management uh, so compelling that I wanted to um, kind of invest at an earlier stage rather than maybe a later one where the, maybe the price is higher but the, the uncertainty is lower. And you know, we'll just just see see how that works out and um, whether in, in hindsight it would have been better to kind of wait a bit longer and see what those risks were. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of uh, open-minded about it. See see how it goes. For another one, or yeah, this, this could be the last one, I think. <laughs> um, no pressure. <laughs> Hopefully, it's good. Um, I'm Andrew Burns. I work with James, who was introduced earlier at Global Endowment, and we uh, invest on behalf of around 30 or so institutional uh, clients in the U.S. Um, and uh, my question is. Um, can you compare for us level of conviction? Uh, you spoke earlier about how important management is. Level of conviction you can get behind management of Facebook, Google, uh, maybe even Novo versus uh, maybe this place or uh, Grinka, something like that. Yeah, yeah so kind of my, my dirty secret on uh, how I underwrite management is, is not so much kind of superior insight about management, it's more kind of picking a very simple universe. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, there's kind of thousands of CEOs out there and if you were to kind of put all of them into a room and ask me to have a conversation with each of them and then, you know, then divide the good ones into the bad ones, I'm almost certain I would be no better than 50-50 or, you know, like a monkey throwing dart against a, a board. So, you know, I think it's an incredibly difficult thing to do and uh, I don't think I'm any better at it than probably anyone else would be. But um, I do think there's a kind of a subset of managers where it's really obvious. Um, and that's kind of the ones where I kind of focus my, my, my energies on. And it's kind of, you know, what, what does that mean it's obvious? It's kind of, um, you know, if, if someone has been at a business for, for 30 or 40 years, like Mr. Grinker has, and it's his life's work, he's built it up, he's behaved impeccably for all of those uh, for all of that time versus shareholders and employees and business partners and it's kind of really obvious um, and that's kind of kind of my sweet spot um, uh, for me it's kind of obvious what Mark Zuckerberg's motivation is with Facebook that there's a as a mission and to the extent money was ever a motivator you would have thought it, it can't be any longer given the, the number of billions that, 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 that he has and, uh, you know, as I go down the list of the companies, I think I would have a kind of a similar similar level of, of conviction over all of them. But but the, I think the trick is to kind of to kind of pick your universe correctly, as opposed to hope to be kind of smarter than other people. How do you how do you pick the universe? I guess it just yeah. becomes evident as you're looking through the company. Yeah, I, I think it's um it's stuff that that can show up quite quickly. Um, you know, so if someone has a lot of long, longevity um, at a company, you know, so they've been there for 20 years or something, so that doesn't tell you whether they're, they're good or not, but it tells you the data is probably going to be there about whether they're good 
good enough. So if you if you do the work, then you're you're, you're going to get to it. Um, um, whereas if someone does, as you know, you know, all great managers presumably at some point, uh, well, obviously at some point, we're in their first year, their second year, third year, and you know, for me it would be too too tough to to kind of spot whether uh, they were they were good ones or not, unless they were the, the kind of the founder and the guy giving the initial idea. Um, and that, that would also be part of the universe I look to is the the kind of the founder or, or the owner operator. So it's really the kind of you know all companies are just empty shells when when they when they get incorporated. And what gives them a kind of a life of their own and a culture and values is is really the first person that kind of founds it and starts hiring people and selecting people based on those values and all that kind of stuff. So it's really the the, 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 the if, if there's an owner operator there and he, he's built the business up over a period of time and you like the result, I think it's exceptionally unlikely that that's not going to be a, a, a good person. Okay. <laughs> on, on that same theme, yeah. when you when you saw what Robin Lee at Baidu tried to do with that video with the video business, how much did you weigh that disconfirming evidence on your assessment of him as a founder owner with high integrity with the shareholders' best interests in mind? Yeah, so, so the question was about Robin Lee, and um, you know, um, about a year ago he proposed to take uh, Baidu's sort of video business private, and um, you know, of course, that's always a, a bit of a red flag for investors when you know a company is selling a business to itself because you know there's two possible well there's two possibilities either it's undervalued in which case um, uh, maybe the guy's being dishonest by, by selling it to himself, or it's overvalued, in which case the guy's an idiot to be buying it. <laughs> so you have the choice, do I want an idiot or someone who's dishonest? Uh, so, you know, so that was that was a, a concern to me, but um, um, not, not, uh, not, I mean, I, I kind of got comfortable with it over time for, for a few reasons. So, um, um, you know, it has to be seen in the context of what had been happening in the years before. So, you know, Baidu's price, share price had been under a lot of pressure and Robin Lee had been under a lot of criticism for, um, you know, for the losses coming out of uh, the video business and also the, the O2O business. And, and so I kind of, I kind of felt it was kind of like almost sort of frustration that if you think this business is worthless or if you're, if you're going to punish, punish our company for owning it, then you know, you know what, uh, you know, I'm going to just buy it myself. So it's kind of a frustration that, that, that I don't understand. And I, and I always had a sense that there wasn't, it was more kind of the initial bid was was was, was born of frustration rather than um, a really a kind of a concrete plan because I don't think there's any huge benefit to him of owning that business uh, separately. Um, so I kind of felt it was never going to happen, to be honest. And um, and in fact, it didn't. Uh, he withdrew the order offer at some point. So it was—it was definitely a red flag. It was definitely something uh, I was concerned about. But um, I kind of got comfortable about it, and, and ultimately, it didn't happen. That was kind of what I expected. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming.